Where we live. How's it going? Doing well, thank you. When did we first meet? Um, Focus Conference in Indianapolis, I believe. We met in the green room. In fact, I still have right? the photo that we took. <laughs> really? Um, yes, still have the photo on my phone. I remember phone. we were hanging out in a green room at a Focus Conference, but I forget which one that I think was. it was Indianapolis. Okay. Yeah. When was that? I don't even uh, remember. That was before COVID. They're doing so, another one yeah. this year, hey? The Focus? Are doing yeah, because I think they did it online. Yeah. Um, last year. I, I think maybe even the year before that, but I think they're, they're going back to in-person now, which is awesome. Yeah. What was COVID like for you when you uh, when all this came to a crashing um, halt? You know, it was it was difficult. What I, I remember I was in Scottsdale, Arizona, and it was the first night of the parish mission. I had preached at all That's the masses on the weekend. Yeah. Okay. You know, and attendance was down because even then they were like kind of warning elderly people or people with current medical conditions to kind of, you know. And uh, it was the first night of mission, and I, I finished the talk. And then before I could say anything else, Father got up there and read the letter from Bishop Olmstead, basically shutting everything down. Hmm. And everybody was like, what? Wait, what? No mass tomorrow? No meetings? I'm like, wait, what? What does that mean for me? Because, like, what well, about this mission? And so they ended up obviously canceling the mission. So I was on a plane the next day um, back home to, to Portland, Oregon, and I was home for over a year. You know, and it was it was difficult, Matt. Um, you know, first of all, going home. Okay, well, well, what happens now? Like, how am I supposed to support my family now? And and, and then as that was happening, all of the cancellations started coming in. Oh, we're gonna cancel. We're gonna postpone. We're gonna cancel. Like, boom, 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 boom. And so I'm like, okay, what what do I do now? And so one of the things I did, I I did two things. One was I started a little daily. Little podcasting. I had no idea. First, the first one was on my phone. I had no, I had no about Zoom. I didn't know anything about that stuff. Uh-huh. So I just got my old phone and just stuck it up and started recording. You know, it's like so I put them on Facebook. Yeah. You know, um, and, and so I it's called the Daily Dose of Deacon Harold. Nice. So basically, just a little <laughs> prayer, mm-hmm. a little either theological or scriptural reflection, and that was it. You know, and that's why I'm doing a Walk by Faith Wednesday webinars. You know, that's why I started giving like a, a extended talk on some topic in theology or something like that. And and then I started interviewing people. I said, I mean, you know, there's some great people I've been meeting as I've been traveling around. Let me help give them a voice, you know, Let me give them a platform. They could talk about what they're doing, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I started doing that. And I'm going to get back to that because that was pretty fun. Um, but I've been so busy now you know, speaking now mm-hmm. post COVID, you know, that I haven't had really time for that anymore. But uh but it was, I mean, it was great in the sense that my family was home because the girls, um, I had two girls in college at that time and both their colleges shut down. So they came home, was doing online studying. The twins were in their last year of high school and that was online. So everybody was home. <laughs> and so we had this uh, this extra time with the kids that we did not expect, which was wonderful. Yeah. Um, so I really cherished that time that we had together as a family. And one thing that was interesting is relating to your children as adults now. No settling. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, we're having these like conversations now, like conversation conversations, yes. you know, like on these different topics and getting their opinions on things and stuff. It was really, um, it was really great, you know, to get to to know your kids at, at a deeper level. And um, so that was wonderful. And then my wife and I had some fairly significant conversations, mm. you know, um, Things that were on her heart that I weren't wasn't aware that those were, these were issues for her, and so we ended up you know we did some counseling quite frankly That's you know awesome. and it was Good it was you. great yeah and I learned um, from those experiences I've been definitely been upping my game as far as what I need to do to make sure her needs are being met. And um, so we did a getaway weekend, and I got another one planned. Don't tell her, but I've got a, I've <laughs> got an, I've got another one planned, um, already planned out, already paid for, and everything. Where budgeted, did you go the first budgeted time? Budgeted for. Went to the Oregon coast to Newport, okay. and Newport is where the aquarium is. You know, we haven't been, we haven't been to the aquarium since the kids were small. Mm. So oh, this will be a great trip. So we went to the aquarium, but it was all COVID, right? So it's like you had to schedule a time to go, and some of the exhibits were closed. And, and it's Portland, so all the fish were wearing masks. Yeah. <laughs> That was well, weird. pretty much, <laughs> you know, and so it was still like the, the quarantine kind of thing. So it wasn't like the, the aquarium was a little bit of a disappointment, quite <laughs> frankly. But but that time with her yeah. was really special and really valuable. So I said, oh, I got to do this more often. 
And so now that we're almost pretty much empty nesters now, um, I'm going to be planning more of these types of, of things. And we never talked about what our life was going to be like after the kids were gone. You know? Yeah, what, what is um, that What is that like? Because my eldest is 14, youngest is 7. Yeah, yeah, you still got a ways to go. And you hear people say, and I think it's good advice, like you got to be working on your marriage because yeah, when definitely. the kids go, this is still here. Definitely. And that's one thing that I, that I, in a sense, took for granted, quite frankly. I mean, my wife's love and support has always been there. You know, and I, and I wouldn't be able to do the things that I'm doing now if it wasn't for her love and support. And um, I just kind of assumed, you know, certain things and and uh and i wasn't paying enough attention to her as i should have um uh, which i which i I definitely rectified now you Mm -hmm. know so um but i remember the first time when claire went to school and uh we were having dinner so we were on dinner table and and claire's spot was empty i said somebody go get claire and they said daddy she's at school i'm like oh Uh. oh right you know so i guess it's just us you know and then then when angela left it's like Oh, wait, no, it's just us and the twins. It was like, wow, it just felt different. It felt weird. It was quieter at home. And, you know, it's just a little strange transition. And then um, Sophia went off to school and then Benjamin. And so it was like, wow, it's just us. You know, it was just it was just strange. And then Claire graduated. Well, after uh, she graduated in 2020, so she didn't have a real graduation. It was like, you know, her face went across the television screen <laughs> you know and that was her graduation at Miller uh-huh. diploma yeah you know so very anticlimactic uh, college experience but she's living at home now she wants to move out trust me but uh, <laughs> but it's crazy expensive to live in Portland right now yeah. it's almost impossible for her financially to move out on her own so she's home and we're grateful to have her home and she's working full-time and uh Angela just graduated uh from from college um uh and uh very interesting. Uh, the, uh, she went to a Catholic school. I mm, use that many in quotes. Of them, yeah. And uh, so at the invocation, at the beginning of graduation, they never, in fact, they never mentioned God the entire time. Mm. Um, they, they, the, the invocation was uh, the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer. Ooh. I'm like, ooh, ouch. And the same school, by the way, during parents weekend, at, when she first was starting, you know, they had this mixer. You know, so they had the, the, the students go off by themselves and the parents were there. And so I was a name tag and I wrote my name on the name tag and stuck it on. And I'm walking around looking at the other, you know, parents. And I, I didn't really take a look at the name tag very closely. And I was looking, I said, what does it say under the name tag? It says, what is your preferred gender pronoun? At a Catholic school. Yeah. And I went, oh, hell no. I ripped that thing off and threw it. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. You know, so I ain't playing is this Is this a game. school in Portland? No. 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 California. Okay. Yeah. So, um... Uh, so wow! So and they, when you were mixing with these parents, did some people have weird pronouns? No, they put he or she or, or I didn't say. But I said no, no, no. I'm I'm, I'm done with this. So yeah. I, I was out of there. Um, and so uh, and, and and then Sophia is at is at NYU, and Benjamin. You know, Benjamin is still trying to figure it out. You know, um, he we were we thought he was going to go to culinary school. Hey, Benjamin. And, yeah, <laughs> he's a great kid. But I mean, Trust but, me. you know, and, and well, Claire, you know, she took a gap year before she started uh-huh. college. You know, and so it's so funny when she said gap year when she presented that to me. I'm like, I didn't, I never heard the term before. Mm. It sounded to me like she said, "I'm going to waste a year of my life doing nothing." <laughs> is what I heard. But yeah, and my wife said, "No, listen to her." I'm like, uh. "Okay." You know? And she <laughs> she goes, "I'm I'm ready." Um, intellectually to go to college but I'm not I'm not emotionally ready okay. to go yet so she needed another year to mature sure that makes so sense so I said hmm okay she might make a better decision about what courses she takes yeah, and yeah. I, I said okay um, this is new for me but I said okay let's do this you, you're gonna do your thing for a year fine but I want you to work I want you to start learning about the value of money and and, and saving and responsibility that kind of thing so she took a, a job at a, a doggy daycare called Noah's Arf Nice. <laughs> and uh, so she worked part time for them while she was also doing some other volunteer work and just figuring everything out. And it ended up being the best thing for her because mm. when she was went to school, she was ready. That's what I mean. She yeah. was on fire. She was like, yes, I want to be here. And uh, it was it was great. When I first um, moved to America, I had never been to university in my life in Australia, it's not the same as it is here, yeah, where if yeah. you don't go to university, it's like not completing high school or something. And I, 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 so I started going to university when I started working with Catholic Answers. I was about 25. And it was great because I didn't waste a ton of money on 
silly classes like lesbian dance theory. I was super into that when I was 17. That's not true. That, I made that up. But uh, so that's probably a good thing. I think it's yeah. important that, that yeah. people maybe take a year out. And, yeah. And that's what Benjamin's done. Same thing. You know, so he's trying to just trying to figure it out. And, um, you know, the worst thing I think with him was online school was going to school online. He was doing great. Mm. All th- man, we never had an issue with him in school. Great student. Then COVID hits, he has to go to school online and he and he didn't go. Mm. So for a month we thought he was going to school because he was on the computer and oh, okay. And then we get this thing like, uh, where's Benjamin? He hasn't been coming. Like, what do you mean he's he's on his computer all what are yeah, you talking yeah. about? And he just he just said the way he put it was like online school was like state mandated prison. Wow. Was the way he put it. And the worst thing for him was asynchronous learning. So it's, it's, it's bad enough that you have the teacher online and trying to keep track of everybody, trying to teach that way. Mm-hmm. But then asynchronous learning, there's no teacher. They give you a set of assignments on Monday. You have the week to finish them. Then you turn them in on Friday. Then the next Monday you get another set. You're basically teaching yourself. Why there's no there teacher. No, why was there no teacher? That, the I don't know. That, 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 cheaper. Yeah. I, for I, the they, they just called it asynchronous learning. Now, there wasn't all the classes were like that, but some of them were it's like, like that. It's like a fancy so, term they came up with so as not to have to play, pay uh, teachers. I, I guess, you know, and, and but that didn't, he did not, yeah. that, he didn't adapt to that well at all. Um, and so basically just, it just the wheels came off for him mm. uh, during that time. And so, uh, so now he's, but, but he's been um, home. He's been reading, you know, like, I mean, Robinson Crusoe and like, you know, all these classic Iliad. I mean, on his own. Good We're for not, him. He's just been buying books and just been devouring <clears throat> books and reading, which he never liked to do before. He's been cooking. He's I think he's a I think he, he, he's called to be a chef. He's very talented have you, in the kitchen. Have you heard of Hillsdale College? I, I've, I'm taking a course just to kind of re-educate myself on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Okay. They've got a ton of incredible courses that are perfectly filmed. Honestly, I think 99% of people going to university, unless they know exactly what they want to do, would do way better on Hillsdale College. It's free. I'm trying to get the president right now to come on the show. He's a beautiful Protestant man. So if anybody knows him, bug him. Tell him to come on the show. <laughs> but yeah, there is there is some really good stuff online. But then there's that asynchronous learning that just sounds yeah. So like a waste. I mean, so he's he's been great, um, <laughs> you know, and and he's um, vegetarian now, right? So which is uh, I just switched to yes, that myself. T- tell us about this. Yeah. <laughs> so look, look, look. You said I, this my, to me today. Almost my whole life I've been struggling with my weight. Okay. Okay. Up and down, up and down. Um, a few years ago, a doctor recommended the. Um, uh, paleo, you know, mm-hmm. or uh, keep ketogenic. Did you do way that? Of eating like you know meat and that yeah. sort of stuff. So I did that. Lost a ton of weight, Great. gained it all back. Tried again, lost a ton of weight, gained it all back. So it wasn't working. And then um, during COVID, being home yeah. and being depressed <laughs> and eating the all the time and close to the fridge and all that stuff, gained a bunch of weight. So then my sister last month sends out a text because me and my siblings keep we have a group text and so we keep yeah. in touch with each other. And so he goes, oh, I'm doing this uh, plant-based way of eating. And, you know, all these health things have happened to me since I went to a plant-based way of eating. She didn't say vegan or vegetarian. She said plant-based. And so I was asking her more about it. And she goes, oh, you have to watch something called The Game Changers Mm -hmm. on Netflix. Game Changers. I said, what is that? So it was about this guy who was an MMA fighter who teaches Navy SEALs and and, uh, guys in the Army, like, self-defense techniques. And he injured both of his knees. And so he goes, well, I need to recover. And how do I? And so he was doing his research about recovery and stumbled across this plant-based way of eating. And one of the guys they had on there was a strong, this guy's a strong man. He's like one of the strongest men in the world. And the guy's been eating plant-based for years. And, and so he says, how could you be as strong as an ox without eating meat? And the guy said, have you ever seen an ox eat meat? Okay, fair enough. And I was like, that's a great oh. response. I was like, wait a minute, what? And so I watched the thing and I was like, whoa, wait a minute. Arnold Schwarzenegger was on there and and you know, and I was like, wait a minute, what what is this plant based thing? You know, and so um so my sister convinced me and my wife been doing it for a little while, so I said, Okay, I'll try it. So I just started at the beginning of the month, May sixth, right? Because I, I was I was going over the, the Holy Land. Yeah. So I figured, you know, that's a great place to start because I got a lot of plant based meals okay. there. So I started and and, and I, I and I've and I've been actually surprised. I, I've I've definitely been losing weight. Wow. I feel it. So are you eating um, my gra- joint? Are you eating grains? Yeah, grains, plant based stuff. Basically anything but meat. 
or well, yeah. What about eggs? So uh, not eggs, milk, stuff like that. You can like, do that. So, uh, the less processed, the better. Okay. That's why I'm not saying vegan because I'm not buying into the vegan mentality of oh, animal cruelty and that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. Although obviously we shouldn't be cruel to animals. <laughs> yes, no, no, yes. I don't want to get the wrong impression here. <laughs> Deacon but, but, I, but I don't. I'm not buying into that that whole <laughs> side of that piece. I understand. But it's just the, the nutrition <clears throat> and the eating and that kind of thing. So for me, basically, the less processed the food, the better. And so, like plant-based milk, like almond milk, and things like that, instead of regular. I mean, th- you know. Are you drinking dairy? Um, no. Okay. I've so. never, I've never liked milk ever since I was a kid. Yeah. I'm not a big milk fan. But you can have eggs. You know. Uh, yeah. So I'm not eating a lot of eggs. I'm trying to get my proteins from from other because eggs basically is from from chickens, right? So it's still a kind of a protein, meat based yep. protein kind but of on, thing. But on on this but diet I, that you're doing, or do they call it a diet, or do they lie and say it's a lifestyle? Yeah, I don't know, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> um, They try to make it sound more appealing. But on this particular thing, is the goal not to have eggs and only to be? Well, eating? it depends what your goals are. So. Um, for me, I'm still going to eat fish. I'm mm-hmm. still going to eat eggs. I mean, not every day, but you know, I'm still going to have those. So what does a typical day you know? look like for you? Like today, what will you be eating? So, Especially um, when you're traveling. Lots, yeah, yeah, so lots of, so I, I, I'm a, a diamond medallion on Delta, which uh-huh. I've been for like five or six years in a row now. So when I go to the club, I'll eat a, a, a big thing of vegetable, uh, fruit. So the fruit salad stuff. Um, I'll have hummus. Mm-hmm. You know, I have brown mm-hmm. rice, tofu, or you know, vegetables, broccoli, Things like that. Um, and I'm surprised. I thought this ain't going to work because I'm a carnivore, dude. I'm like steak, burgers, fried chicken, like bam, you know. Mm-hmm. And I thought this ain't going to work for me. But I've been very surprised how much I don't miss meat. You know, I I, 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 I thought for sure this was going to be really, really hard. And I think starting off in the Holy Land and eating a lot of tabbouleh, a lot of the, the plant-based stuff made the transition a little easier for me. Ordering, ordering vegan meals on the on the flights on the on the um the transatlantic flights and stuff, and you know I've I've been embracing it and and you know uh, it's only been like what three weeks right, but I've noticed like the joint pain really is gone in my knees uh, and my and my shoulder and, and that's and, fantastic because um, my it, wife says I'm not snoring nearly hey, so nearly there's no nearly way she's going to let you eat meat again yeah then. yeah nearly as much as before oh, I, so. I think what's difficult is there's so many experts yeah, pushing yeah. so many different types yeah, of exactly. eating like it's only you could do only carnivore or only plant or maybe paleo or maybe keto that it's so confusing that it's so gratifying when you start eating the way you're eating and you notice the effects mm-hmm. yeah because yeah. I think that's that's what matters. I imagine for some people, like Jordan Peterson's on an all meat diet, he says it's working wonders. You're on all the 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 point is like, is it actually working in my life? Yeah, I, I've cut exactly. out I've cut out sugars and grains for the last eight weeks, except honey. I allow honey and and I've been I feel so much better. Yeah, and, and I think no matter what you do, you're gonna feel better. So I think it, it, it comes down to what's good for you, and mm. and, and you gotta go to the doctor, get your blood levels and and and, and enzymes and that check to make sure. That it's healthy for you, you know. Yeah. So again, I liked the uh, the 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 uh, paleo, and I and I liked the keno kinogenic because it's meat. Like, yeah, well, you, you, know, you said to, earlier when you were doing paleo, you lost a ton of weight. I lost a ton so of weight. So why not just go back to that and not do this plant based? Yeah, thing? because I done it twice and gained all the weight back. Hmm. You know, because um, I think for me it was more about the the weight loss than actually like living. That yeah. kind of lifestyle, and then yeah. like you'd miss certain things like breads and. <laughs> that kind of things and then you know when i'm traveling and speaking i treat me like here i am away from my family i'm sacrificing doing this great work for the lord i deserve that slice of pizza mm-hmm. or i deserve that extra piece of cheesecake or whatever it is you know and and then you just get back into the old bad habits again but i think what's what's happening now at least with the plant based it's a different mentality for me now you know i'm not thinking it's not so much like oh i got to lose weight I, that's really not the whole thing it's like Okay, I, I've got to um, adapt this lifestyle because, you know, diabetes runs in my family. Heart disease runs in my family. Mm. Uh, my da- dad had colon cancer, you know, so I'm like, whoa, hold on here. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm getting older. I, I realize, Matt, I'm more, I'm closer to the end than I am to the beginning. Mm. You know, so I said, I, I've got to, you know, as long as the Lord wants me to do this work, I got to make sure that I'm keeping myself healthy so that I can continue to do the work that God has called me to do. So that's a different mindset and a different way of thinking than I was when I was doing a ketogenic. I'm not, not knocking ketogenic. I'm not, I'm not telling people don't do it. 
But for me, it was like I lost a bunch of weight and then gained it all back. Lost so it was the idea that it wasn't sustainable. It wasn't for me. Yes, it was not you. sustainable. Right, yeah. So um, like it's only been a few weeks with this plant based thing, <laughs> well, but three, so far, three weeks is impressive. So I mean, good, you know. Um, and my sister sent me a cookbook. Um, it was a, these firemen, I guess, you know, put together a cookbook because it, it, one of the things in the in the uh, game changers, they uh, went to this fire department. A lot of these guys had heart disease, stuff like that. But after eating this way, like the health things improved significantly. So these firemen wrote a cookbook based on yep. this, you know, uh, plant based eating. And so my sister mm. sent me that book. So I haven't I haven't been home. Uh, long enough to to dive into those recipes, I will uh, after I leave here. Do you find you know, that I'll be, you're, I'll be home for a week? You're starting to even lose. Is meat beginning to lose its appeal? Even or no. no? <laughs> <laughs> Let's be real. No, it does not lose its appeal. But it's just I'm not craving it yeah. like I thought I would. Yeah. Like I'm not as tempted to cheat like I thought I would. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, wow, this is surprising. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff is actually quite good. You know, like I used to knock people with tofu, like, oh, yeah. tofu, yeah, yeah. Like, what is that? You know, I used to like literally make fun of people that used to eat that way. I, I was at a burger joint and I accidentally ordered a vegan burger. I didn't yeah. know that until I was halfway through and I was raving about how great it was. And someone said, you know, that's that's not meat. I had I couldn't believe it. It was <laughs> See, terrific. And, was and, and that's what I'm finding now, you know, and for me, it's about the long, the long game. Yeah. Now, yeah. so it's not about like I mean, not gonna go to scale every sprints, day. I'm not gonna marathon. right, yeah. right, right. So, given uh, how I'm feeling just after a few weeks, even better than I was when I was doing ketogenic. You know, as far as the the way I'm that feeling, is, that's you so know, good. so I was like, okay, look, I'm 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 get us a legitimate a legitimate shot, and um, so so I it's just been a few weeks, but I'm but I'm committed. Isn't it it's wonderful, though, right when you choose yeah. to live a different way and within a few weeks you want to keep living that way? Yeah. What's brutal and exhausting is when you think you ought to do something and that thing is exhausting and doesn't seem to be yielding any fruit. As soon as you start seeing the fruit, you're like, okay, this this could work and I feel good and that's terrific. Yeah, and I think uh, this help, it's helped me in a holistic approach. To life so mind body and spirit right spiritual i've never had a real struggle with that i mean i love praying to office my rosary mm -hmm. chaplet every day i mean that's you know i i'm dialed in but then the uh and the mind intellectual stuff so i i love i've 3600 books in my library at wow. home have you ever seen some of my podcasts you see all these books behind me they're like Dang, Deacon, that's a lot of books. That's that and even all of them. If I were to turn the camera around, you see the, this whole room is filled with bookshelves, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that's been peace, but it's the body piece that's always been lacking and always been a struggle for me. So what what this way of eating, at least so far, has done, it's brought me more uh, focused into my prayer life, you know? Um, How so? So jesus talks about fasting it's like no, not if you fast when you fast mm. so there's an expectation there about fasting and so for me this way of eating is kind of like fasting for me you know what i mean because all the things that i love the meat and all that stuff and dessert staying away from that um for for a, a higher goal and now the higher goal is not just the physical but it's also the spiritual you know and that's brought that into clearer focus for me in a way that that it hasn't before in, in the other ways of eating that I was trying in the past. Again, I'm not knocking those things. I'm not saying that they're bad. I'm not saying don't do them. But for me, personally, this this way of eating has brought me into more clearer focus. No, I know what you mean. I mean, most of us just eat whatever's in front of us without giving it much thought, or at least that's the easiest way. So whatever kind of restrictions you're placing on your diet, like you're living a more self-controlled, more intentional life in yes. the way that you eat. And that can only be beneficial, I would imagine. Yeah, exactly. So so that's what I'm seeing so far. And so my wife is thrilled, you know, Good. so uh, so and my son has been, and been cooking those kinds of meals, you know, so it's when I go home now, it's going to be easier for me to uh to adapt to that kind of eating, which I'm excited about. Yeah, that's awesome. Can I just give a quick shout out to nutritional yeast? Because okay. it tastes like cheese, but it's just yeast. So it's just okay. like protein and sodium. That sounds gross. It sounds gross, and I was reticent to buy it the first time, but once you put it on something, it just tastes like cheese. It's right. so good. I'm going to have to try that, Neil. Thank you. Nutritional yeast, yeah. Okay. And then I guess drinking doesn't change. Or how Are you kind of like trying to regulate how much alcohol you take no, I don't, in? No, I don't or, drink. Oh, well, that helps. Um, you don't yeah. have coffee either. No, no, coffee, no, no. I, so, so the alcohol thing was my father was an alcoholic growing up. Uh, so, and um, did you never there, drink then? 
Well, there were some, I mean, because of the, some of the crazy things that went on in our house, none of the four of us kids drink. The, my siblings and my, we don't drink. Yeah, okay, I got to college, right? So, yeah, I mm -hmm. did my little, I mean, I, I got drunk once where mm -hmm. um, where I, like, passed out and stuff like that. And I woke up like, where am I? That kind of thing. I'm like, I will never do that again. That was the dumbest thing I've ever done. And, because I was playing quarters with shots of Jack Daniels. Mm-hmm. Which was dumb. What, what does that I, mean? Quarters with what's that? Uh, is that so a game? I, back, so I, I was in, in college in the eighties, right? Uh -huh. So there's a game called quarters, <laughs> where you would bounce a quarter off a table, and if it fell into your glass, you'd have to drink. I see. I sucked at that. <laughs> I was horrible at it. <laughs> or but in a way, it, you were good at it. That sounds impressive to be able to but bang they, it. But but then the thing is, if if the person got in, you had to drink. I see. And if they, you know. And, it, and if you didn't get in, you had to, I was like, oh, no. Oh, so if you I, didn't get it in, you yeah, had to, I Yeah, so it's like, so I, I was horrible <laughs> at the game, and I, you know. Um, so, so alcohol has never been very attractive to me. Again, I'm not against alcohol. I'm not against people who yeah. drink just for me, personally. It just doesn't do no, it's it obviously, for me. I think, if you're not drinking, I imagine that's better. Yeah. Like how is that? I, yeah. People talk you know, about the nutritional and, benefits of alcohol, but I'm pretty man, sure there's not drink much in that. Like I have, I'll have a, I'll have I think a we poison. just like to tell ourselves what we want to hear. Like I, I refer to my cigar in the in the morning sometimes as my, this is my daily greens. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like we all tell ourselves the things we want to hear to make uh, yeah. our, our vices seem more virtuous. Yeah. I mean, I'll have a glass of wine, you know, you know things like that. So I'm not like uh, totally, but, you know, um, so I have wine occasionally. And then with coffee, I just never liked the taste. The first time I ever had coffee was in college. Really? Um, you know, it was um, trying to stay I was up. trying to step away, doing a paper, <laughs> trying to my first all nighter. Yeah. And my room was like, he drinks some coffee. I said, OK. Whoa, whoa, man, what, what, oh, this stuff is nasty, you know, and you so that's, I was introduced to Mountain Dew, because this, ah. this is before the five-hour energy and all that kind of stuff, oh, like, this was wow. way before that. Have you tried that five-hour energy? I'm no, always afraid, I'm whenever afraid. I look at it, I think it's going to kill me immediately. I, that's, I think I'm going to have a heart attack, <laughs> I I'm drink, I'm drink, all the caffeine in my heart is going to buy power, so I'm yeah, afraid to take yeah, that yeah. stuff. So I've never done that, but I've never just a, a, acquired a taste for coffee. We got to drink so. it like my wife drinks it, with tons of sweetener and yeah, almond milk and yeah and no, all sorts I just, of weird things these days like no, lavender just, latte no it just nah. doesn't do it for me just no. like it's kind of like um when i was overseas like, i'm a very dairy i've been to 23 different countries mm. speaking and i and i'm oh. a very daring eater yep. so I, i've had you know i've had um tarantula oh i've my had gosh. yeah i've had uh you know uh uh not octopus but um jellyfish and things okay. like that and but there's a couple of things I won't eat. <laughs> that, well, one of my tried. I said I would never eat it. By that one was durian. What is that? So durian smells like a dead body. It smells <laughs> like a corpse. So what is that? It's like? this big green <laughs> fruit with kind of spikes. It kind of looks like a pineapple, but not okay. not as spiky as a pineapple. Where but were it's you? Big when... big green fruit. Malaysia. Okay. In Kuala Lumpur. So you cut it open, and it, oh, it just reeks and there's this big yellow sack in the middle and it's inside the sack that's what you're supposed to eat and you can see billboards for it it says smells like hell tastes like heaven oh so they even admit it smells bad oh yeah you can't eat it in public in Singapore it's like you can't eat it's a rule or a law you can't eat it in public because of the stench it's just horrific can you look up if it's illegal to chew gum in Singapore for me Absolutely, I have heard that it that is. is. I've been to Singapore five times. Yeah, no need to, but look it up anyway. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Go yeah. to Singapore. Yeah. Talk about government overreach. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you can't eat chewing gum. But it's it's very clean. You know, um, I've hardly seen. I, I think I've in the five times I've been to Singapore, I think I've seen one homeless person. Wow. You know, um, so I, you know, it, it's very. I think they got it very dialed in there. Is it but, true? So it's not illegal to chew gum in Singapore, but it's against the law to import and sell it. Import and sell. Except you can't for sell like nicotine gum. gum, you can do that for some reason. That's funny. With the yeah, kick the habit. Isn't that interesting? Hey, different yeah. laws, different countries. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, did you, you try this disgusting dead body smelling thing? Or yeah. So and there's a picture of me on, on Facebook. You have to scroll through, but I'm like, uh, ooh, taste it. It don't taste like heaven. I'll, I'll tell, tell you right now. Much. It don't taste like heaven. <laughs> it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, but I didn't think it was taste like heaven uh, either. So I'm like, mm, not again. And the other one was called Balut in the Philippines. What's that? Um, so they say, you like eggs, Diga? Oh, I love eggs. So <laughs> this big egg, which is obviously is a duck egg, not a chicken egg. Uh -huh. And you crack it open, there's beak, what, feathers, that? embryo. Shut up. Embryo in there. And, and I'm like... <laughs> You eat that, like, just, oh yeah, dig it, just bite it. I'm like, I, just I ain't putting that in my mouth, are I, you nuts? I love the impression of the duck fetus that you just did there. 
That's fantastic. I mean, beak feathers. People are eating that? And they eat that. I'm like, oh, no. They, and what do they do no, with the feathers? They spit no. it out? They, no, just eat it. You just eat the whole thing. God in heaven. <laughs> So that's the only thing that I have not tried. I, I I went ahead and tried the durian, but I I have not gotten myself to do balut. Um, how, how did somebody suggest tarantula to you? Where were you and how did that go? That was also in Malaysia. And so what happens is, is this um, this woman goes out with her kids in the morning and they look on the rocks and under logs. So they get these tarantulas, they bring them back, they boil them to kill them, and they defang them, and then they burn the hair off. Oh, and then they my put it, it, it was sesame oil and garlic and stuff, and they're real crunchy. I it's kind of like, like, like a chicharron. How big is you it? Know? Uh, well, well, good size. And it looks tarantula. like a spider. On oh, yeah. Your it like, oh yeah, it's a tragic. Like, you know, it's like a chicharron. Is, like a, do they not have food in Singapore? <laughs> it's Why like are they snack. going looking under? It's rocks? like a snack. You know, it's a snack. This is in Malaysia. And does it taste like garlic? I guess. <laughs> yeah, it tastes. I thought it tasted pretty good. It tastes like a like a almost like a chicharron, right? You know, like the pig. Rind, the pork rinds, uh -huh. that that kind, not not as sweet as a pork rind, but I guess but when you I, think about it, it, like pork rind is like you you fry the skin of a pig. I mean, that's right. pretty disgusting. Can right. you do that on your plant based diet? No, no, no. Tarantula, no, no. I, but that weird well, green death smelling thing, you could do that all, <laughs> all day long. That. I'm not going to do that anymore. Hey, would you ever but, eat tarantula? Yes, I'd probably. You would or you have? I would. I haven't, but I, haven't. I think I'd probably do it. When I was in the Philippines, you know, I just had fish in the morning, and they give you this fish, but. That to me was gross. I mean, I didn't mean to be disrespectful, and I'm glad that they enjoyed it, but I, I just couldn't stomach. Yeah, yeah. F I, fish and coffee. Oh, yeah, because for, for me, uh, the reason why I even uh, try some of those things, uh, I call myself a daring eater, because because <laughs> food kind of brings you into the culture. That's right. Right. You know, in Barbados, in my country where I was born, um, they serve fish whole with the head on. So yeah. one of the things that they do for a guest is that you you know they serve the whole fish and you have to suck the eye out of the head of the fish. That's what they do for a guest. Yeah, if it's, 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 my father used to do it at home all the time when my mom used to cook fish, he's <laughs> suck because he was the head of the, the house as, as dad, right? So yeah. so when you're a guest in someone's house, you suck you get the honor of sucking the eye out of the the head of the fish. That's the honor. Good in mm -hmm. Barbados, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I was watching, uh, what's that survival video, Alone? You ever seen that series? No. Basically, they send 12 people out on an island and whoever lasts the longest wins. And you got to find your own food, make your own shelter. And somebody said, you know, people need to be hungry enough to be excited to smash the skull of a fish in and suck its brain and, eye, and, uh, and, brain, and eyes out. That's how hungry they were. But I can't ever imagine doing that, not feeling that hungry. But good for you. That's great. <laughs> oh my gosh! So twenty three countries. You yeah, said, that's yeah. amazing. And you you proclaimed the gospel in twenty three countries, yeah. or you were just there visiting for different reasons? No, I, I proclaimed the gospel in twenty three countries. Yeah. Speaking Where's the most interesting like place you've been? Um, you know, I, I would say the Asian countries: Singapore, Malaysia. Now, in Malaysia, for example, um, it's it's a it's on the Sharia law, right? The mm -hmm. entire country on the Sharia law, and so. My going there to preach was actually illegal. Mm -hmm. um, so when I went to the parishes to speak, you know, there were tons of people. I remember one church in particular, Divine Mercy, um, in the outskirts of Kuala Lumpur. Uh, we're driving and they don't, if, if the government allows them to build new churches, they can't build in the city. The churches that were there from the time of, you know, the Jesuits and, and, and that colonial times, they allow them to continue to exist, but uh, if if they allow them to build a new church, they have to be outside outside of the city. So we're driving, and, and we're we're in this factory area where they're they're making purses and shampoo, and we finally get to this church, which on the outside looks like a kind of a modern building, but mm. inside is beautiful, mm. you know. And there were ten thousand people, one priest. Oh my! And so I preached at all the masses on the weekend. There were probably twenty five hundred people every mass, and they wanted to be there, and they were passionate, and they were in love, and and I remember clearly from that experience, feeling like in countries where there's some oppression, is where the church is most alive. This is the church most most passionate. I've had some very moving moments in South Africa. Okay. Um, after preaching at a mass in Soweto, which was two hours and 20 minutes long, but it felt like five minutes. It was amazing. It was beautiful. It, the mass was in Zulu, Sotu, English, which I preached in English, which, you know, uh, I think they did it for my benefit, and Latin. Mm. 
You know, and some of the, the main responses were in Latin. So I said, Father, after Mass, I said, Father, this is awesome using Latin. He goes, Latin is the language of the church. Latin's what pulls us all together. And so after Mass, we, he goes, now we must take Jesus to the people. I'm like, oh, okay, we're going to go to say Mass somewhere else. We had a Saborian with us. So we drive to the squatter camp. Now, when you see these things on TV, mm-hmm. much worse in person. Really? We're, we're walking through this thing, and it's these tents or these shacks with these tin roofs, dirt floors, no sewage system. I mean, the stench nearly knocked me to the ground. And what I noticed was I didn't see any adults. So I'm figuring, oh, we must be going to where the adults are gathered for mass. That's why we're here. So we made our way, and so we got to the center of this place, and the only adults that I see are nuns, full habit. It was hot. It was summertime. Full habit, humid, and all these kids. I'm like, well, where are the adults? And it, and it finally hit me in talking with the sisters. This was this particular squatter camp was for AIDS orphans. Mm. These were for children who literally were left in garbage cans, oh. who were driven out dumped and then left there and these sisters gathered all these children some left in toilet bowls some left wherever and they gather and they and the sisters created the squatter camp and 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 i never felt more proud to be catholic than that moment it was one of the most beautiful things i've ever experienced all everybody else rejects these children and here is the catholic church in the midst of this squalor, in, in the midst of the, the, the anguish, here is the church serving literally the poorest of the poor and, and, and the, the people that are rejected, the people that are not wanted, you know, and it just, it was, it was absolutely beautiful. And I will never forget that experience as long as I live. And, and even, you know, the nuns handed me one of the kids out. And the first thing I was thinking, this kid could kill me. You know, that was my first, this kid had AIDS, this kid could kill me. But then I saw it was just a kid. It was just a baby. I'm like, what you got going on over here? You know, and it's just like, you know, it's just a baby. You know, it was just, it was just an how many, amazing experiences of my life. How many nuns are serving these children and how many children were there? Oh, gosh. Um, well, there were nuns and then there were volunteers from other countries that were also helping out as well. Um And, and so, um, and the nuns also run an orphanage, which I also got a chance to visit. So uh, and then and then they exchange. So there's some nuns that run the orphanage and they go out into the field and the other ones come back. And um, there were probably 50, 60 kids there and how in they... this camp. And the government supplies, you know, money so they can run the thing. But um, but they all can't fit in the orphanage, you know, so that that's what they would love to put all the kids in the orphanage. They just, they but, just can't. Like, OK, so, I, you know, obviously children need a lot of care. They need to be taught how to basic hygiene and when to eat and what to eat how are the nuns and the volunteers doing all that or are they just doing it the best they can they're doing it the best and these children are living parentless alone in shacks yeah and now with the volunteers coming in the volunteers are helping out and teaching you know providing support and food and hygiene and all that kind of stuff and what were the kids like what was their disposition you know uh they they were joyful because that's all they know there's no, there's no television. They don't, they don't have access themselves. to Western culture. They, I mean, they're at least these kids. They're not, they're not looking at what else is out there. So that's all they know, you know. Um, and so they're joyful because they're, they're with, and they, there's a wonderful sense of community, you know. Um, so it's called uh, Nazareth House is mm. the is is the, the 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 name of the orphanage that they ran there, and uh, it was just um, this was in South beautiful. Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's beautiful, moving experience. Absolutely. Uh, several years ago, I was invited to go with Father Stan Fortuna to speak in Abu Dhabi. Mm-hmm. And while I was there, I remember they said, just don't speak against the prophet uh, uh, because there'll yeah. be some people here. And I said, well, he's not a prophet. They went, that's what we're talking about. Don't say things yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. um, the call for prayer bellowing in the mosque next door, mainly Indian and Filipino folk, but also some locals. Uh, and there was several thousand there. And I had the honor of meeting the bishop of the underground dioceses in uh, Saudi Arabia, as well as four folks from Saudi Arabia. And I was desperate to meet with them. I wanted to talk to them about what it was like. And you've probably had a similar experience, but the priest was there and he's from the Philippines. And they talk about how they celebrate Holy Mass in his apartment and how there's a driver who was there who would drive around in secret picking up the Christians. 
They would always have people around the perimeter of the building with cell phones in case the police were coming. They would then call the people at Holy Mass who would then pull out a birthday cake that was always present in the fridge and turn the celebration into a birthday party. And I said to the priest, wow, "Wow, so how did you get um, into Saudi Arabia, you know, as a priest? He said, oh, no, I I came as a mechanic. I said, wow, you're a priest and a mechanic. And he went, (laughs) no. (laughs) <laughs> oh, okay, you lied about being a mechanic. God, okay. But it's just remarkable to see these people in, in serving the church in persecution. They asked me to come to Saudi Arabia and preach. They went, no, you wouldn't get beheaded. They, they, oh, good, all right. That's a, they said, no, they would, at best they would send you home. You know, they, yeah. would, they would send you away. They said, we recently had some people who were arrested because we had a conference in this old barn. But they always take their shoes off before coming into a holy place, which I think is a really cool thing. And I guess the police saw this mountain of shoes and... Then arrested people. Oh, <laughs> I see. I see. Well, no, it's just like Moses burning bush, right? In Exodus, you take mm-hmm. your shoes off because you're entering a holy place. That's cool. But what surprised me was they weren't super Christians. They're, they're really no different to you and me. Mm. Um, and I think sometimes we have this idea that they must be like a cut above the rest. And maybe in certain instances they are. But I've known many and I continue to meet many holy people in the United States who love Jesus Christ and would, would give their life for him yeah, should God provide absolutely. that grace for that courage. But yeah, we can certainly learn a lot from Christians persecuted in different countries. Yeah, and and um, one thing I think they appreciated was the fact that those countries don't also don't allow other priests to come in, right? So the, the for example, the last time I was in Malaysia, these priests are like eighty years old, ninety missionaries, but they were grandfathered in. Mm. Now they don't allow priests to come in to take their place. The only thing they allow is homegrown vocations because there's so few of them, mm. they don't feel threatened. Oh, yeah, go off to your seminary, whatever. I mean, you know. So when these priests die, it's like, wow, there's not going to be many priests to come up and, and, and take their place, you know, which is which is why I always say yes to go to preach at places like that, to try to, not, I'm not taking a place of priests as a deacon, you can't no. do that, but, but just to bring the message of evangelization. And to, what's their hope. response to you? Oh, it's very, <laughs> they, they, it, it's very different style because they think I'm yelling, you know. Uh, and, but because people on yelling. the West Coast think that too, because I'm from Jersey, right? I, grew up, I was a barbarian, but I grew up in Jersey, you know. So I, I grew up a lot around a lot of Italians, right? So I got yeah. I use my hands a lot. I'm, and I'm like, oh, I'm not angry. I'm like, it's passion, you know. But they mistake it for anger. It's like we think they said, thank you, Deacon, for coming and yelling at us. I'm like you're very welcome, you know. So they're not <laughs> offended then? No, no, yeah. oh no, not at all. Yeah. No, they like the passion. Yeah. They're just not used to that. Yeah. style of presentation you know but but they they very much enjoy it though well when i was in uh uganda a couple of years ago speaking to these catholic leaders they treated me the way i treat scott hahn because uh not because i'm nearly as bright obviously as scott hahn but because they they hadn't been the they haven't been benefited by the apologetics movement in the united states in the way that we have so they'll ask a simple question like, well, why do we call Mary the mother of God? My Protestant friends are saying this. And you'll give the simplest answer and they'll fall off their chairs like it was the most brilliant thing they've ever heard. So that's what I noticed, that they they hadn't benefited from these wonderful people like Carl Keating and Patrick Madrid and Scott Hahn and all these others, Mary Healy and others, you know, who who are really saying the basic truth, which to us, we're like, well, of course, that's what we call Mary the mother of God. She's, a Mary, she's the mother of Jesus. Jesus is God, et cetera. But so I found that they were really grateful when I came down. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, <clears throat> you know, the best reception I've ever had anywhere in the world was in the Philippines. Yeah. You know, um, and, and, and I've been there four times and I've been going down to the school in uh, in the southern part uh, of the city in Quezon province, not not Quezon City, mm-hmm. which is near Manila, but Quezon province, about a four or five hour drive south. And I go to speak at this school. And the last time I was there, they like this massive, massive, like, billboard thing with me on it and stuff like that i'm like welcome back deacon harold and that all the kids were lined up you know so as i was entering the school there were kids on both sides clapping and cheering and waving flags and (laughs) then they had this whole presentation where they sang traditional songs did traditional dances in honor of my wife and you said i think i'm I'm staying here (laughs) (laughs) you can come if you want it's a little bit uncomfortable quite frankly but it was it was also very cool Hmm. to see how enthusiastic they were uh, about about coming, you know, because that doesn't always happen, you know. <laughs> we get that kind of, you know, uh, 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 that kind of welcome, you know. Yeah. So it was, it was really cool. 
as the America has become sort of increasingly post-Christian, have you had any recent negative experiences when you've proclaimed basic truths yeah, of the faith? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, if I say the city, because <laughs> people watch are going to know where, where this is. But um, I was at a city recently where I gave a, I preached at mass, um, and then I gave a talk to middle school students. And I said basic things like marriage is a man and a woman, uh, that males are actually males. males and females are actually females, that a child in the womb is a person, it's not a blob of tissue, that um, our, our brothers and sisters who are same-sex attracted, we love them with the love of, of Christ, you know, absolutely, unconditionally, um, but we love everyone, but we always don't love their actions, we judge actions, we never judge people, things like that. Mm. And the kids at the end were like, when are you coming back? And and, but some of the parents and the teachers that were there, I got some of the the most hateful emails I think I've ever received in speaking. This is at a and Catholic school. This is at a Catholic school. What sort of things do they say? Don't ever go near my kids again. Um, bigoted, closed-minded, homophobic. Um, they couldn't call you a racist. That must have been nice. Yeah, yeah. They or did they? Me, no, no, they didn't <laughs> call, call me a racist. Um, it was just uh, belittling. At, at homing them attacks instead of instead of yeah. uh, attacking my arguments they attack me personally you know um, it's just you know it's just eh, I mean I, you know in a sense you could that could be disheartening right mm -hmm. um, but it was okay how know? did the um, head of the school or the leaders of the school respond presumably no nothing they, I didn't hear anything from them I still haven't heard anything were, were from they them. happy that you said basic truths or do you think they were well I think they were polite and thanking me for being there but I think Mm. They were like, uh oh, we didn't what expect were they this. You know, because, uh, and I found out later that Jason Everett was also there and also did not get a nice. So, we should have told me this before. <laughs> I would have called Jason, Jace, what's up, man? We're, we're, am I stepping into a lion's den here? And that's, he, he got, he was warned not to say this and not to say this. And he was like, wait, what? You know. So, um, did he say it anyway? He did, but I think he nuanced it in yeah, a way, still sure. pissed some people off, but I yeah. think he nuanced it in a way that. You know, um, that was more appealing. I mean, if I would have known that ahead of time, you I still would have spoke the truth in love. But you would have massaged it. A little. I would have massaged it a little bit, a little bit better. Not, not to deny the truth, not to mm. speak the truth in love. And that's why I thought I did, but I did it in a passionate way in my my style. And they thought I was angry. They thought it was attacking. I'm like, no, what? The kids understood what I was saying. The yeah, kids got it. The kids were smart enough. Yeah, and 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 um, they weren't the ones that pushed back. It was the parents and the and some of the teachers there? Because I noticed. During mass, a lot of teachers didn't receive communion. I said, "Oh, they must not be Catholic or state of mortal sin or something." But mm -hmm. I, I learned later that um, that the vast majority of the teachers are not Catholic at that school, oh. um, and so there was a lot of pushback on what I had to say because they're not really teaching the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. so, so a lot of kids are hearing these things really for the <clears throat> first time, and 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 it was v for the I guess for the parents and some of the teachers it was very jarring. For them to hear the truth presented in such a bold, powerful, unapologetic way mm -hmm. with passion and conviction, you know, and they and they took that as attacking and belittling, and which is which, of course, is not. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and most of the people get it. And I've been criticized, but people don't like my style. I'm like, well, then don't go see someone else. <laughs> no, don't, don't, I, I'm not going to change because you don't like my style. It's, I'm, I'm being honest to who I am. I love being Catholic. I am passionate about being Catholic. I'm not afraid to, sh to share that and, and to show that. No, I think that's great. When you start editing your personality to make yourself acceptable to all comers, you end up as interesting as dentist art. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> you're not offensive. You're also not interesting. And you've said nothing helpful. So I think that's really great that you're like, no, this is this is my yeah. This, this is, is how just, I, I just have to be. I have to be the person who God called me to be. Was there a stage in the beginning of your ministry where you felt tempted to maybe change your style? I think the first time I got criticized, it was like, oh, maybe I should change my style. Maybe, and I and I prayed about. I spent a lot of time in adoration. I prayed about it, like no, you know, because what's what's happening is this that I realized. Even I have people walk out on homilies, you know, and, and what happens is. <clears throat> I'm preaching the beauty of the truth. And there are people that are listening to what I'm saying that are rooted in their sin. They're very comfortable in their sin. 
And so the conscience always wants to turn back toward the true, the good, and the beautiful. Mm. Uh, towards as uh, the sonum bonum, as Aquinas calls it, right, the, their ultimate end. And so when the when you prick that conscience, and the conscience wants to turn back toward the truth, they fight that conscience. And because you're the one that caused that tension, they blame you. It's your fault. You made me feel like this is you're you're saying these things. That's right. And and they attack me without even thinking about what I'm saying. You see, Absolutely. but 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 I try to use opportunities um, <laughs> to try to preach the gospel without preaching the gospel. So let me, let me give you an example. I'm not, I'm I'm crazy pro life. I'm not afraid to speak on, on pro life stuff. And I was at um, a pro life rally. Uh, this was an outdoor event, and the way they had it set. This was in January, right? So um, you know, Roe Ro- 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 Wade month, that whole thing. So they had a two stages. They had a stage at one end of the plaza where the speakers. They had another stage at the end of the plaza for praise and worship. You know, so the speaker would go, then the praise and worship. Then the speaker would go, praise and worship. And this is actually on my YouTube channel. So you see me get up there to give my speech, and you hear all these protesters. So the camera pans over, and you see tons of protests across the street with the, the blue police barrier they got their signs and they're yelling things like get your rosaries off my ovaries things like that so i say on the video let them yell they're not going to be as loud as me right <laughs> and so i talk i talk for about 17 minutes then the, the the video stops here's what you didn't see i got off the stage i greeted a few people and then i saw that the 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 protesters had shifted down the street because they wanted to drown out the, the praise and worship band. But this one young lady was, you know, was still there. She had her sign brace against her, her knees and she had her head down. She was texting. And I said, let me go say hi. You know, so I walked under the police table. I walked toward the blue police barrier. She did this. I know you. You were just the one that was up there talking. How dare you say a woman doesn't have a right to choose? How dare you say a woman doesn't have control over her own body? You want to go back to clothes hanger abortions? And she just ripped into me. She was yelling so loud, she was almost spitting in my face. Oh. I just stood there and said nothing. So now I'm going to describe her only because this dictated my approach to her. This was in Oregon. So she was what I call a typical crunchy Oregonian <laughs> young adult, right? In her 20s, blonde, white, dreadlocks, um, Birkenstocks, tie-dyes, ripped jeans, piercing tattoos, smell like, you know, that not fruit hairy. Okay. Yeah, smell like she'd been hugging a tree in the wood for three days, that kind of thing. She had that kind of vibe going on. So when she finished yelling at me, I said to her, are you a vegan? She said, don't change the subject. I said, actually, it's pretty relevant to what I have to say to you. So... You don't eat meat? I don't eat meat. I don't eat fish. I don't eat eggs. I don't eat butter. I don't drink milk. I don't eat anything produced by an animal. Because we they, they fill these animals full of hormones and chemicals. And they take these animals into laboratories and fill them with diseases to find cures for us. No, I don't eat anything produced by an animal. Do you recycle? Of course I recycle. We have to protect Mother Earth. And then she started talking about greenhouse gas and global warming and global footprints and all this kind of stuff. And so she finished. I said, you know what? I can totally appreciate where you're coming from. Let me tell you how, how we understand as Catholics. You know, in the Bible, it says that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Right? And I said, when you eat good things like you're doing, you take care of yourself. That's a wonderful thing. I commend you. The Bible also says that we're supposed to be caretakers of creation. So when you take care of the earth, that's a good thing. I applaud you. But can I ask you a question? And how is she at this point? And she's she's like, uh, but she's listening. She goes, I said, are you on birth control? What the hell <laughs> kind of question is that? That's none of your goddamn business. That's a personal question. I said, well, we're both out here talking about abortion. That's pretty personal, too. Humor me. And she leans in. She goes, yeah, I'm on the pill. So what? Mm-hmm. And I went. Just make sure uh, you're behind this. Yeah. Or, and I went. Uh, uh, uh. Now I'm confused because you just told me one of the reasons why you don't eat meat. Because they fill these animals full of hormones and chemicals. Yet you're taking an artificial hormone that tricks your body into thinking that it's pregnant. And when you piss out the estrogen, it goes into the river system and kills the fish. 
what so, you said. So I, I, I went on my phone. I put this little study from uh, Colorado yeah. that showed the effects of river fish downstream from a sewage treatment plant because of the effects of uh, uh, sewage and um, estrogen in the water. And I held up my phone to her. I said, the very animals that you're trying to protect, you're killing them. I said, I'm green and organic when it comes to sex. How come you're not? And waited for an answer. So now she's like, uh, see, because now she has to think. So what mm. I did was I took all the emotion out of it. And I and I asked, it's a very Socratic method, right? Yeah. right? I asked a question. I just waited for an answer. She couldn't answer because now she has to get past all the emotions because she realized the self-contradiction she just made. She goes, now, how do I get myself out of this? Now, as I'm waiting for an answer, we got a problem. The, the praise and worship band finished playing. So now her friends are coming back. I'm oh. like, this is going to get ugly real fast. <laughs> so I took out one of my cards and I wrote Pope Paul the Sixth Institute. I said, green organic sex for free. Check it out right here. Now, Pope Paul the Sixth Institute, yeah. right? In, in, in Nebraska. Omaha, right? The, all, NFP, all the good stuff. So what could she have done at that point, Matt? She could have not taken the card. Mm -hmm. She could have taken the card, <laughs> spat on it, threw it back in my face. She could have taken the card, crumpled it up or ripped it up and threw it back in my face. She took the card without saying anything and put it in her purse. And when her friends reached us, I backed away from her. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Now, why did I do that? So she could save face in front of her friends. Now she doesn't have to explain why were you talking to him. But Did she pick up on that, do you she think? She took the card. Now, that's effective evangelization. Is it my job now to follow up with her and see what God did in her life? Nope. I, I, I gave, she took the card. She went, now what's she going to do when she gets home? She's going, when nobody's around, she's going to go, what is this? Da, da, da. See, because the, the, the whole goal for me in a confrontational, confrontational situation like that is how do I get this person in front of me to want to listen to more of what I have to say? It's not about winning arguments. It's not about even who's right or who's wrong. Ultimately for me, it's what's true and what's not true. Th that's Ultimately, and I'm not trying to convince anybody. I'm not trying to proselytize. I'm not trying to change anybody's mind. But I will give you something to think about. <laughs> mm. See, th that, that's, that's the approach I try to take in those situations. Yeah, it's difficult to be in those situations because you can't really prepare them. Prepare yourself for them unless you've been in those instances multiple times. It's a well, very frightening thing when well, someone's that's that That's what I angry. do. I try to, pre I try to prepare <laughs> myself by spending time in adoration thinking, okay, if, if I was asked about this, how would I respond? Or how do I think through these things? Or how do I get this across in a way that's meaningful in someone's life without pissing them off so much that they don't mm. ever want to hear anything I ever want to say again? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. So, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about these things. I'm praying about them. When the opportunity presents itself... I'm like, oh, here I am right now. Okay, I just, okay, just take a deep breath. Lord, you know, speak through me right now. <laughs> you know, uh, let, let your love work through me right now to this person who's very, very angry and upset. Because the last thing I want to do is to feel like I've won this argument and the person's even more upset than they were before. And what hmm. have I gained? Nothing. Fulton Sheen said it's entirely possible to win an argument and lose the soul. See, th there you go. And that's what I don't want to do. So I want, hmm. I want someone that walks away from me to be thinking. Even if they don't like what they heard, at least they're thinking about it. Are you concerned that as the polarization continues in America, that we're not actually talking to each other? We're just talking to the people the, who agree with us? Yeah. I'm concerned about that. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what's happening. I mean, you can't have respectful dialogue anymore. I mean, I worked on a college campus for uh, uh, 11 years um, as a police chief. Mm. And... Um, you know, you notice on college, when I went to college, when I was a freshman at Notre Dame, right? The people you disagree with, you'd have these intense arguments. To, and then you go have, okay, let's have dinner. Okay, okay. It was never personal. But now, if you say something that offends someone, they have these safe spaces. So you, oh, you offended me. Where's my safe space? Where you can go and like puppies and pet puppies and balloons and listen to Barry Manilow and, and oh my uh, gosh. you know. Those poor puppies, eat, that's going to be hell for them. Cheesecake they go or hang something. Out with and, those, uh... You know, it's like, what? God, why, eh? can't we ha why can't we have a dialogue where we agree to disagree? Because speech is violence, Deacon. That's why. Yeah, see, that, that's the problem. And we and where you can't even have a respectful dialogue where you <clears> respectfully <throat> disagree with each other, but still respect each other as human mm. beings made in God's image and likeness. That's a problem. We can't have those discuss where we're learning 
from each other. We're growing in colleges and universities. The problem is they're teaching young people what to think, not how to think. And that that's a huge, huge problem hmm. because all they're doing is they're um, giving them an ideology would allow with a lot not allowing it to develop a way of thinking and critiquing what they're hearing you're serving the thing immediately you don't know love and serve you serve the ideology you come to love it feel affection for it and then you rationalize what you can't then, then, know because it's not everyone true. that doesn't agree with you is a hater hmm. everyone that disagrees with you is a bigot everyone that disagrees with you is a homophobe everyone that disagrees with you is you know and you start labeling people and you and we never get to a, a deep honest understanding and appreciation that's why i love what you're doing here on pints with the Quiet. i watched an episode not too long ago where, where scott Hahn was talking with this dude that's like thinking about becoming catholic i forget the, the, the gentleman's name cameron cameron mm. and just the dialogue between the time i said why can't we have more discussions like that mm. you know he's asking questions good questions you know and and dr hans answering the question and he's you know he's not necessarily changing the, the, the young man's mind but at least they're thinking at least they're doing it respectfully that's I love that. That's honest, and, and that's helping each other to come toward ultimately what is what is true, good, and beautiful. I think one of the things that prevents dialogue is with. It seems like the media is trying to make us afraid of each other, right? So I want to ask you about racism right now, and I've been told that I'm a racist because I'm white. I well, not directly, but that's the kind of sense I get when I watch the news. I also get the sense that to even ask the question about racism is inappropriate. So it's like, well, how can I dialogue if I can't actually try to understand somebody's opinion? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it did little things too. It's like I want to help this woman at the airport, but I've also been told it's sexist to open a door for her or to pick up the suitcase that she's clearly struggling with, that sort of thing. So it's like we're afraid to even engage each other because we've been told or we're being conditioned by whatever media we're in, in taking that it's uh, the the other is the enemy. And yeah, that I guess that's what I mean. So I want to ask you about racism because you're writing a book right now. What's it? Yeah, about? it's called <clears throat> the, the working title is called Building a Civilization of Love, a Catholic Response to Racism it's for Ignatius Press. It's due to come out in the spring of next year, 2023. And um, I wrote the book during COVID, you know, because like, what else am I going to do, right? So I wrote, and I've been thinking a lot, a, a lot about these things, um, especially given the climate that we're in the country and the George Floyd thing and all that, and the other instances of of of, uh, of racial tensions and things like that. So I said, let me let me write something about this. So so what I did in in, in the beginning of the book was talk about to define what racism is. I was right? going to ask you to do so, that for me. Tell me so, what that is. What does racism so, mean? So. Uh, ra racism uh, or race, right? As as I define it, it's it's not about um, uh, it's 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 you have to make the distinction between prejudice and racism, right? So prejudice is a preconceived notion about someone, not based on any observable or subjective experience. Okay. Not based on observable. Right. So you're making a judgment about someone. Yep. You're not basing it because you know the person personally or there's any objective fact. You're just saying it because you're just looking at them and making a judgment about someone Can I just, without, without knowing I just that want person. to pause a moment without knowing where you're going. I don't know if it's possible not to do that. Now, you shouldn't be enslaved to that and you should be critical of your own assumptions of people. But if I encounter, let's say, a South African or a New Zealander, and every New Zealander I've met was a certain way, then it's, I don't know how you can then not encounter a New Zealander or a South African and assume that this is what you're going to get, especially if it's been confirmed again and again. So I just want to throw that out there. I want you to push back on it if you like. I'm not saying we should be enslaved or beholden to those prejudices. Right. I just don't know if it's possible not to have them yeah, as humans. And, and, and we all have them as human beings. We all have these prejudices. But that's why I'm making a distinction between prejudice and racism. So gotcha. I'm not saying that's, that. Um, so let, let me just finish the definition. So, so a preconceived notion about someone not based on any observable subjective experience. Now, what that becomes racist, we take prejudice and you say the reason why I am saying this is I believe that my race is superior to your race. So the reason why I'm saying this subjective thing, this, this, why I have this prejudice because I believe my race is superior to race. That's racism. Yeah. So let me give you an example, okay? Agreed, by the way. At, at a, at a um, 
parish mission not too long ago. A guy came up to me, found out I went to Notre Dame. He goes, oh, you went to Notre Dame? What position did you play? <laughs> now, he assumed in his mind that I played football. Why? Look, I'm a big guy, right? So, And I can see the calculus in his mind. Big black guy plus Notre Dame equals football. When the truth is, I've never played football in my life. If you put pads on the floor, I have no idea what to do with them. You know, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a football player. I got an academic scholarship. So what he should have... Now, people say, that was racist. No, it wasn't racist. It was prejudice. <laughs> See, he, mm-hmm. he made a preconceived notion not based on any experience. He didn't know me. He just assumed the way I look, went to Notre Dame, I must have played football. See, that, that's a prejudice thing. That doesn't make him an evil or bad person, mm-hmm. but the statement itself was prejudiced. If it, if it was racist, he would have meant when he said it, in order for it to be racist, the reason why I said that is because there's no way that people of color can get to a school like that of academics. The only way you must have got in is by playing sports. Mm. That would have been a racist statement. That's not what he meant because when he found out that I didn't play football, that he went, he, oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. he was embarrassed. See? So, so the statement was prejudiced. Again, that doesn't make him a bad person. But we have to recognize we have these prejudices within us. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't angry when he said it mm-hmm. because I knew it wasn't a racist thing behind it. Um, what he should have asked was, oh, you went to Notre Dame, what did you study? Because <laughs> that's what he would have yeah. asked anybody else. Yeah. You see, so th- that's so I have to tease out racism versus prejudice because everyone has prejudices, right? When, when I first started traveling to the South, I thought everybody ate like shrimp and grits. Because you're from the South. I heard that people in the South like shrimp and grits. Well, I found there were some people that don't like it. You know? Um, so, so we all have these prejudices and these preconceived notions. That's not racism. That's not racism. So I make those distinctions. I also make a distinction between institutional racism and people in institutions that are racist. Mm. Right? So we had institutionalized racism in the past, right? Uh, slavery, duh. Right, Jim Crow, apartheid in South Africa, um, those are redlining, the practice of redlining. Um, those were all very clear institutionalized racist ideologies. Um, but now we have to, because now, for example, if you're um, a, a federal loan officer, right, we have all these laws now that the, that it's illegal mm-hmm. to treat anybody that way that based on color or anything like that but you may have someone who works that says we well, you know i'm not comfortable giving loans to blacks and hispanics i'm not going to give them to white people now the institution is saying no that's you, sh- you that's wrong but the person still has the ideology in their mind see yeah. so you have to the, distinguish the institution from people in institutions who are racist right so even the catholic church fell down on this. Mm-hmm. My little parish in Portland, Oregon, Immaculate Heart of Mary, was traditionally a German and an Irish parish. So to this day, we have uh, on the high altar, we have a beautiful statue, a statue of our uh, 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 of our uh, Immaculate Heart of Mary, because that's the name of the parish, Immaculate Heart, duh. But on either side of Blessed Mother, we have St. <clears throat> Patrick and St. Bonaventure mm. for the German and Irish parish of the parish. Beautiful. Um but back in the day, when I talked to the older parishioners who were there, um, they came up from the South during World War II to work in the shipyards. Uh, so they came up from Louisiana. They came up from Alabama. They came up from Texas and other places. And, and Immaculate Heart was the closest church to the, to the shipyards. So that's where they went to church. And they had to sit in the choir loft or they had to sit in the back. Now, they were follow- why was the church following Jim Crow? We're supposed to be following Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. not Jim Crow. But that was, a practice, that was a practice, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was a practice that was even in, in the church itself, right? Wow. And, there, and there was, you know, I document in the book, there were religious orders and priests and bishops who sold slaves, owned slaves, that yes. kind of thing. Wasn't um, the Catholic Church at one point one of the largest owners of slaves in the United States? Somebody's told me that. Um, I didn't find that. In, in my reason, but I was look, I was looking for statistical stuff. So I was just looking at here. We have to be honest about where we were as a church yeah. when it when it comes to this issue. And even though I document pope after pope after pope came up with very very strong anti slavery statements, the the the, the uh, hierarchy in the country at the time were like, well, that doesn't apply to us. That's Europe, and that that's the, mm-hmm. they don't understand what's going on here. That kind of a thing. So they kind of ignored it and and, and pushed it to the side. And I also talk about some very uh, strong Catholics who were very anti-slavery. So, I, you know, I try to find that balance in there. And then I talk about certain ideologies that people are trying to bring in 
to the discussion about race and the, the Catholic fit that don't belong there. Um, the the critical race theory, uh, liberation theology, and the Black Lives Matter movement. What is that? What is critical race theory and what's wrong with it? All right. So, you know, when I was writing that section of the book, I had intended to put all three of those into one chapter because the book is not about that. The book is about a Catholic response to racism. Mm -hmm. But I, I felt that I needed to address those because people are saying we need to incorporate these in, to help close the racial divide. Mm -hmm. And so I had heard about critical race theory. And so I said, well, let me understand what this is. I don't want to read what some political pundit has to say about it or some critic. So I, I got the books by Janine Stefanik, uh, Richard Delgado, Derek Bell, um, Kimberly Crenshaw. These were the founders of Critical Race Theory. And I read their books mm. to understand <clears throat> Good for you. what it is that they're talking about. And it took me a month just to write that. So, just to get my mind around the terms they were using, which I've never heard before, and the concept. It's, a, it's actually a very complicated concept. So I said, well, why? wait a minute, where did this come from? So I had to trace the history back and then move it forward to show why it's incompatible with Christianity. Um, so critical race theory comes out of critical legal theory from the 1970s. So critical le legal theory looked at, even though civil rights laws have changed, the, 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 the attitudes haven't changed. So the example I use in the book is from a golf course that was bought by a evangelical church in Texas, in the Dallas, Fort Worth area. They bought the golf course, not to buy a golf course, but they bought it because they want to control what's being built around them, mm. around this community. So when they bought the golf course, they were learning the history of it, and they learned it was all white, you know, and, and there were no people of color allowed to golf. And so when the, the laws changed, the civil rights laws changed and all of that, you know, one of the guys on the board of the golf was like, okay, great. I got this friend who's black. He would love to play here. You know, And so the rules were you, the person, any, any new members had to be nominated by the board and they'd had to have the majority of the board approve the person. So this guy brought his friend, you know, and, but, but every person of color that was brought there was not approved. When was this? What year? So this, this would have been in the eighties. Wow. Mm. So even though the laws changed, the attitude hadn't. The attitude had That's what critical legal theory looked at. But that came out of critical theory from the 1920s, which came out of Marx and Freud's um, um, uh, dialectical materialism, mm -hmm. which came out of the Hegelian mm -hmm. dialectic. So I'm like, wait, wait, wait a minute. So then how do we get from Hegel all the way down to critical race theory? So, you know, Hegel posits this thesis, mm -hmm. antithesis that leads to a new synthesis. Okay. So you have an idea, you have a contrary idea, the tension between the two leads to a new idea, which he, which he calls... Which is a better idea, presumably. Which is a, a, a better idea. Mm -hmm. What Marx did, and Freud, he took Hegel's concept and applied it to politics and the sociology. So now you have the, um, the proletariat and the bourgeois, right? Thesis, antithesis, the tension leads to a new synthesis, which ended up being communism or socialism, socialist communism from Marx. And so, but, but the, 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 the thing that the, the, the thesis antithesis, uh, what, that ten, is, 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 what, what causes that new synthesis is tension, conflict, struggle. That sounds familiar. And that's the hermeneutic or, or the interpretive key that, that's fed all the way down to critical race theory today. That's the thread that's common when you look, trace the history all the way back and then forward. Tension, struggle, conflict to to uh, affect change. Mm -hmm. Now I'm thinking to myself, that's not a Christian approach to change. Tension, conflict, struggle. You know, uh, so so now you mm. got critical race theory. If not for them, race is not about biological distinction or characterization within a species. So it's not about. I'm black, I'm Hispanic, I'm Asian, I'm Irish. It's not about nationality, right? I'm, I'm Mexican, I'm Italian, I'm Nigerian. It, it's not about that. It's a social construct. Mm. So race is a socially constructed phenomenon in which the people of the dominant race suppress um, and oppress people of the other races. For them, that's what racism is.
And so they make five basic assumptions. I'm not going to go through all of them now. I want but, you to. Uh, okay. <laughs> five if you basic, want. Yeah. So I have to, I have to look at some, some of these oh, concepts. No problem if you don't yeah, have so, it on so, hand. But. So um, one of them is um, that we are innately racist. So we're, in other words, we're born racist. Racism is something that's, that's um, not learned. It's innate. And what does racism mean in their context? So when you say racism is innate, what do they uh, mean by that? We're born racist by, by the very nature of who we are. But what does racist mean? But that's, 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 their, that's their idea. It's not a, it's not a biological distinction characteristic. So, so it's not about color. It's not about the objective thing that we see from the outside. It's a social construct. Racism is something that's socially constructed. Okay. In which the people of a predominant race oppress people so of, of a lower race. Something you just sort of—it's caught, not taught. Sometimes, right? So, so how do we get there? Well, the people of the predominant race are innately racist. Okay. Like you're racist because you're white. Yeah. And I'm thinking, hold it, from from a Christian perspective, or from a Catholic perspective, particularly, we have this thing called original sin. So God created us; we were good. We're ve- we're very good. Then we had the fall. Mm-hmm. So we're not innately. Race, we're not innately sinful. We, the, our first parents made a choice to choose themselves over God, to choose their will over God's will. Mm-hmm. That's what brought sin into the world. So to say that you're innately racist by, by but just the fact that you're white, you're innately racist, you're born racist, that is completely wrong. So I had to address that. In, 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 uh, it's okay. Well, it's, again, I, I'm critiquing it from a Catholic perspective. I'm looking at as as a, as a Catholic, okay? Because people say we need to introduce cri- critical race theory to Catholic schools, into into the churches, and I'm saying, well, hey, let's take a look at what this is and see if any of these tenets are compatible with the Catholic faith. So that's what I did, and I and I was thinking, I did that thinking, maybe there's something here, maybe there is something yeah. here that we can use. I went, I looked at it objectively. You want to find truth wherever here. you can find right. it, right? Maybe there is something here that we can use that's good. And so that first one. <laughs> No, mm. because that just goes against the, the Catholic understanding of the nature of sin nature and the nature of sin and the fact that racism is learned. It's a learned behavior. It's not something that's innate. It's something that's learned. Because think about it. Just anecdotally, you see little kids on a playground. The black, white, they don't play. They don't care. They don't, they don't play. Notice, they yeah. don't even notice. Mm. They're just kids playing. But then what happens over time? You hear these jokes, right? You hear mm. things from your parents. You see things on television. Right and 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 social media, all these things that perpetuate a certain stereotype, and because and so you start to think, well, maybe that's true, or maybe that's just the way it is, or maybe that's and we start to develop these prejudices, Mm -hmm. which may or may not lead to racist attitudes. Mm -hmm. You see? Yep. So so that that what I just explained there, uh, uh, how we developed racism is is contrary to what critical race theory teaches. And so this is why, under critical race theory, a black person could never be prejudiced or could never be racist, racist right. which goes against your initial definition of racism, since it's theoretically possible that a black person could think that yes. Africans are superior to Caucasians. Correct. But even if he thought that, under critical race theory, he wouldn't be racist. Correct. See, and that's, that, that's a problem, because it takes the objectivity out of it. it becomes, to me, it becomes subjective. Mm. You know? um, another tenet that they have here is something that they call um, these dual characteristics of white over color ascendancy, ordinariness, and interest convergence or natural determinism. Again, you're like, I'm like, wait, <laughs> what, what is this? Because I've never heard these terms before. So um, ordinariness, as they define it, um, means that racism is difficult to address or cure because it is not acknowledged. As a result, racial injustice becomes the commonplace or ordinary experience of non-whites. See? Mm-hmm. So, so racism is an ordinary experience for you as a white person. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, again, why do, they, why do they say it's the experience for... Uh, so racism, the way I experience it, is ordinary for non-whites. But see, here's the thing. I grew up in Hillside, New Jersey. Okay, right outside of Newark. And we went to, to Christ the King Parish, and, and this is Archdiocese Newark. Um, uh, and, and that parish is predominantly white. There weren't that many black Catholic families in the parish. And I never felt r- r- racist. I'm, I'm never for the kids didn't like me or didn't like me because I was black or treated me different because I was black. I mean, I didn't feel any of that. But according to them, I should have felt, 
you know, this white over color ascendancy that the white people are, you know, have this ascendancy over people of color. And, and, and so you, you innately feel like, oh, I, I should, I, I'm feeling, you know, like I'm being, uh, that someone's being racist against me because I'm like, I didn't feel any of that. Girl, I was in Boy Scouts, we were all mixed. I mean, some of my closest friends are still white guys from, from Troop 99, you know, and I love those guys. You know, and, and they have tremendous, res- we have tremendous love and respect for each other. I've never, you know, so I'm like, well, wait a minute. What, what, what are they talking about here? It, it's almost like they're trying to create tension. That's right? indeed remember, what's what, Because what, what's, the, what's the foundation? Conflict, mm. tension, struggle to get to a new synthesis, to get to a new evolution. I'd love your take on this because it, it seems to me that if maybe as a kid you were ingesting CNN and Hollywood as it is today, Maybe you would have chalked up every um, unfortunate encounter with somebody as an instance of racism. Like if I had have come to America and I was told everyone in America hates immigrants, like they're really prejudiced, especially Australians, they hate them. If I was told that and I believed it, then every unpleasant interaction I had with a barista or somebody, I went, see, that's that's because they hate Australians. Now, that might be the case. But it would be difficult to pass out whether it was or whether it wasn't. Do you think that's see? And fair? that's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to do. When I'm trying to parse out racism and prejudice because yeah. we all have prejudices. Yeah. What we and, and and the last part of the book, what I talk about is how we overcome those prejudices to build the kingdom of God on earth to actually close the racial mm-hmm. divide. And I think the Catholic Church can take the lead in this issue, Matt. Why? Because there's no one doing it right now. Now, back in the sixties, Martin Luther King. And one thing I have to say. I started reading a lot of Martin Luther King and researching this book, and I had not read a lot of him before. I am c- totally impressed with his approach. When you read the letter from a Birmingham jail, it was no- Nobel Prize acceptance speech. I'm like, oh my goodness, he laid out a plan which was gospel-based, which was focusing on Jesus Christ, which really had concrete things to really close the race of violence. Like, oh my goodness, this is awesome. And then he, then he, was, then he was killed. And then no one really picked up the torch after him in the way that he wanted to do it. So in the midst of this leadership vacuum, this leadership void on the air of race, what we're having right now, we have organizations, individuals that are claiming to want to help close the racial divide, but it's a Trojan horse. On the outside, it says racism, but on the inside is a whole other agenda, which has nothing to do with race. It, they're using it as a, as a Trojan horse, as, a, as a, a vehicle to bring in their real agenda. And that, that's why we're, we're seeing so much problematism. There's no one, because Martin Luther King cut through the polarization of black and white, <laughs> liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, because he gave a message that everyone mm-hmm. could say, yes, this makes sense. We don't have that now. How would his writings and speeches be received today from a critical race theory crowd? Suppose he was invited to... Oh, well, critical to... race theory thinks that the civil rights laws benefited white people. But what about his speeches in particular? That's what I'm asking. Would they themselves no, they, be received they, they, as... they think that a Christian approach is a waste of time. Hmm. That, that a Christian based... In fact, Derek Bell says that in his book. I quote that in my book. So modern people talking about in the critical race theory movement would consider Martin Luther's message a waste of time. Yeah, because what you have to do is you have to change institutional structures. That's what you have to work on. And see, Martin Luther King was talking about changing hearts, mm-hmm. where, and individuals, right? Um, the, the Christ-based approach, building relationships and that kind of thing. Of course, that would lead to, uh, mm-hmm. to structural change as well. But they, but the, Grace Theory, forget about the people. We have to change the structures. We have to change the, the, the we have to knock down the walls and, and things like that. So that, and that's where, again, the, the, the same common thread with liberation theology, same common thread with the Black Lives Matter movement. It's not about changing hearts or minds or souls. It's not about sitting down and having real conversations, even though they may be difficult. You know what? I would appreciate Matt if someone came to me and said, you know what? I, I'm, every time I walk down the street, I, every time I see a black people, I get scared. I just tell the black I don't want to feel that way. Can, can we talk about that? Mm. <laughs> that is so honest. That's awesome. I say, yes, please. Let's sit down and talk about this. You know, and, and the example, I know this example, I used my roommate in college, right? Uh, so I lived in a triple. And back then, Matt, there's no internet. There's no Facebook, no social media. There's no computers. Right? So, <laughs> so you got a letter. Okay, here's your roommates. Here's where they're from. I don't know if they're black, white, whatever. So I get to the room first. I'm in a triple. 
I don't want to unpack my stuff because I want the other guys to get there to figure out what we're going to do with the room. So I'm sitting there and I got bored. So I pull out my guitar and it was 1984. So Van Halen is 1984. And I'm a big, huge Van Halen. I love Eddie Van Halen was a hero to mine, of mine. And so I started learning Panama on my guitar. And so one of my roommates walks in, Ed. He looks at me, he goes, which one are you? Because you know, on the list, I said, I'm Harold. He goes, you're black. I'm like, oh, hell, this, <laughs> this, this ain't a good start. And then he, he saw me play. He goes, what are you playing? I said, I'm playing Van Halen. Black people listen to Van Halen? I'm like, oh, this is bad <laughs> right here. This is not uh. good. So I come to learn that Ed grew up in East Chester, New York. It was one black person his whole high school. He didn't know anybody black. Now he used to live with me. But what we did over that year, we got to know each other. He got mm. to know me. He got to know me. He had no experience. I got to know him and experience him as, a, as individuals, as persons. And so uh, our living together started to break down those walls. We became very good friends. We roomed each other the next year. Um, he was in my wedding. I was in his wedding you know, after graduation. And so we really, so th those are the kinds of things I propose in the book. I talk about at the parish level that we can do to break, begin to break down those prejudices and those stereotypes and mm. really get to know each other as individuals made in God's image and likeness. You gave three instances of institutional racism. Today, what what are examples of institutional racism in your mind? Does it still exist or are we just coming up with things? Well, no, I think there's still things that are interesting. Well, obviously, the clear examples are the, the uh, Ku Klux Klan and, and white supremacists and those kinds of Absolutely. things. Absolutely. Obviously, institutional racism. Yes, of course. Um, but and like uh, the golf course example would be another one. Yep. There's still golf yep. courses that are that like that, example. that have the is unwritten right? rule, hmm. you know. Um, and, and But one thing I want to address is the... Um, is the police thing. Because they said, well, the police are institutes racism. No, they're not. You know, um, I was in law enforcement for 23 years. I taught at the police academy. Uh, I was in a governor-appointed position where I was on the the, uh, the the board of the Department of Public Safety Standards and Training in Oregon. It's the agency that oversees the training of all police officers for the state. I served for six years, two three-year terms. You get term limited out. I was appointed by two successive governors, and I, and I chaired the board in, in my last term. I am intimately familiar with how police officers are trained. I guarantee you, no one police officer is trained to kneel on someone's neck for nine minutes. That's that's ridiculous. I was watching that video of George Floyd. I was like, what the hell are you doing? Get off his neck. I mean, he's he's cuffed, he's contained, he's not a threat. Why are you still on his neck? And the other officer stood around and watched it. I was pissed, man. I was angry, and so were many other officers who saw that, who know that's not how we're trained, who are out there um, putting their lives on the line for complete strangers because they 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 feel called by God to do that, and and these few ones that are that are that may be a race of prejudice are, are causing the problems, uh, and and that's what and that's what everybody sees. Mm. They don't see. It's like like the, the, the priest abuse scandal, right? All the priests are pedophiles. Like I, I know priests that are afraid to travel in clerics now mm. because they're going to be called pedophile and child molester every they walk through an airport or in a grocery store. So they wear their 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 traveling clothes or their secular clothes because they're afraid that, of that witness. Um, same thing here. The people, oh, you you must you you know, press against black people and that kind of stuff. No, I mean you know not everyone's like that. So to say again, people in institutions are racist, but the institution itself is not racist. You see, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But there could be departments where they do practice, like in, it's in the South. Like, you know, th there are places maybe that do practice that kind of, well, well what are you doing here? You're on, the, you're, you're on the wrong color. We don't see many people of color in this part, of that kind of thing. That's, that's, that's would be institutional racist where it was, a, even if it's an unwritten rule, I see. that would still be an institutional racist. Mm. So it's not in the written policy, but it's kind of like, you know, we got this understanding mm. that we're going to treat people this way. That would still be institutional racism. Yeah, so what we want to do is not throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's what it sounds like your new book's about. Because critical race theory, rubbish, Black Lives Matter. Movement, cop, movement. not the words. Of course not. The yeah. words are perfectly fine. Right, but that's, yeah. that's the problem with sophistry. That's the problem with slogans in general. They're intentionally ambiguous, like love is love. Well, of course <laughs> yeah, it bloody yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, you got to tell yeah. me what you mean by that. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have, what do you think that white conservatives get wrong about racism? Because I, I think a lot of white conservatives feel attacked constantly by the media, by big tech, by Hollywood, who are all pushing this critical race theory. Is it possible that the pendulum swings so that they're not even open to hearing about legitimate instances of racism? 
Has that been your experience? Yeah. Or no? I, well, I think what um, what white conservatives need to do is first of all understand what critical race theory is, and 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 um, and Can, not just and not just say, well, I don't like what you're saying, but mm. why? What is it? Yeah. About what you're saying, that does, that's why I try from a cat. So I'm approaching. I'm not approaching from a sociological, psychological perspective. Yeah. I'm approaching from a faith-based Christian perspective, and that's what I haven't seen yet in this whole dialogue. Here's but my, I'll, although I've seen Catholics embracing it, m- m- even writing books about how we should be embracing it. Interesting. And I, 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 I don't I, think they understand it. I'd at love all. you to talk about that. M- m- here's my concern. I feel like we, I feel like that critical race theory is making a meme out of racism. Such that if if the, if big tech and everybody else are saying you're racist, you're racist, you're racist, eventually, like, okay, well, clearly no one's racist because what you're saying is bullcrap. That's the pendulum swing I wouldn't want to yeah. see happen. Right. No, so I agree. In you, like, and then for you, is this something you said as a kid? You were never cognizant of being treated differently, anything like that. I mean, have have you seen instances of racism in your own life in your own ministry, or is that do you feel like it's been totally overblown well, by I, the media? I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Um, well, I, I, well I, I said it's more prejudice than, than racism. Because like, it's difficult example, to pass out, yeah. isn't it? It's a sub, Unless you know exactly why it is why they said is, what they said, yeah. and that's not always... So, for example, I remember going to a, a parish um, in Florida, and it was about a two-hour drive from the uh, airport. So they told me, rent a car, you know, drive. it's going to be a pain to have somebody drive two hours, two hours. Yeah. No problem, rent a car. So the address they gave me was for the church, not for the rectory. Which was not on the property, the campus, uh, the, the the church campus. It was in a neighborhood somewhere. So I said, "Oh, okay. Well, I still got plenty of time. Let me ask somebody at the church where the rectory is. So I can go meet Father and get settled in before I had to preach at five o'clock mass that night." So I went up to the church, and on the door of the church is a poster of me, like, "Oh, do you got, oh, great, great." So I, and I someone's come out of the church. So I went up to the person. I say, "Excuse me." And the first thing I said was, "The Saint Vincent of Paul is closed today." Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. And I remember thinking, wow. And I said, that's really good information. <laughs> but actually, you see that post on the door? That's me. I'm I'm actually trying to find where the rectory is so I can at least meet Father before Mass tonight. Oh, oh, Deacon House. Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, that kind of thing, you know? See, I would imagine or, you only have to have a certain number of instances like that happen to just make you very attracted to critical race theory because that's that's horrible. Yeah, or for example, in Chicago, I was speaking at an event called Holy Fire, right? Mm-hmm. Paul J. Kim was the speaker. So, so in fact, I have a little video of it, on, I think, on my uh, uh, Instagram. And so it's 5,000 people, this thing. So I go first. So I get on the stage. I do my thing. I come off. Paul's getting ready to come on. So, and Paul said, hey, look, let's meet up for dinner afterward. Oh, it's great. So I, I'm dressed like this, mm-hmm. right? Deacon pin, crucifix, <laughs> miraculous metal suit. And I go into the elevator hotel to go up the change. And wait, wait for Paul. And I walk into the elevator. The only other person is a little white lady. Mm. And so I, I just be implied, I just nod my head and yeah, I don't say anything. <laughs> and she, her eyes get real big. She backs up and grabs her purse. Oh. Okay, now people may say, well, look, maybe she, and I, I get it. She, I, I've interviewed and, and investigated a number of rapes in my career. Okay, I, I get it. She may be experiencing post traumatic stress mm-hmm. syndrome for something she experienced before. Okay. There's also something unsettling. Let's be real about getting into a confined space with a stranger, especially, no matter what color they are. A big man. No matter what color they are, right? Yeah. I mean, you get into an elevator, confined space. You're in a stranger. Oh my god, it's a little bit uncomfortable. We all, we all, we all felt that, right? That wasn't what bothered me. Her grabbing her purse is what bothered me. What I can see with her backing up. And go, okay, big black guy. She might be intimidated. Something might happen. But why did she grab her purse? Th- 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 that was the. I mean, what, do you think I was gonna rob her? And and and, mm. and the, I mean, I understand. And, then, and so I got out of the elevator, and I just remember feeling. Yeah, well, upset. How that, I was gonna ask you. How, does how that make come you feel? she never saw me? Mm. Yeah, and when people don't see you, it hurts. It hurts when people see a stereotype. And they don't see you. It hurts, Matt. You know. Um, uh, I, 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 you know, when, when, when I sit down with someone on the plane and you, and, 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 and I, I heard one guy literally say, oh no. As soon as I got ready to put myself in the grade to sit down, he looked at me, he, I heard him say, oh no. Like, and I didn't say anything, but I almost like saying, you didn't think I just heard what you said? Do you not want me to sit here? That kind of thing. But I said, well, if he's going to be uncomfortable, he's going to be comfortable for the next two and a half hours, <laughs> you know? And, um, I mean, so things like that. 
Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's red, prejudice, whether it's racist, I'm not sure because I'm not in dialogue with them to see where they're coming from, mm-hmm. but it still hurts. Whether it's re- race and prejudice, it still hurts. See, I think this is really important for people to hear because on the one hand, you want to reject the critical race theory, the Black Lives Matter stuff. But on the other hand, to deny all these instances of racism that still exist is is too far. And I could understand why someone would want to look at those things to try to find solutions. But we as people of faith have to remember our focus needs to be on Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm. That has to be the focus and the center of our approach. So so I don't want to spoil, spoil the ending of the book, but but one of the things I talk about in there is the, the Good Samaritan parable, right? Uh, our, our tendency is to want to leave that person on the side of the road. But Jesus says, no. <laughs> we, the, his whole point was we have to be the Samaritans. That, and, and that's why I think the Catholic Church can take the lead in this issue. Mm. You know, we can fill that void because we always come from behind on issues. I mean, the Catholic Church, we, we're afraid to speak out on things. And when we do, it's too late. Like the marriage thing. We should have been all over that thing when the Obergefell thing was being d- decided and all that stuff. Instead, because we were still reeling from the sex abuse scandal, we're afraid to speak out boldly on issues of truth. And so we held back. And then what happens? Obergefell happens. And then we issue statements. <laughs> it's too late. It's too, Now, with race, I think we can actually take the lead that people can look and say, ooh, look what the Catholic Church is doing. And we can actually lead people in actually bringing people together and building relationships. But do you think, though, that your book and the message you have about racism would be heard by someone deep into critical race theory? I think we'd have to have a conversation first. And have because, you had these conversations with people? Are they open? No, to I, I'm actually going to, I actually have an engagement where, coming up in a mm-hmm. week where I am going to be engaging someone. And, and they want to do it in a debate style where I will be talking with someone um, who's Christian, Mm. um, who is a supporter of critical race theory, and we're going to be, I guess, having this debate. I'm not sure how it's all set up yet, but Mm. uh, debating this person about critical race theory. And I hope it's not a debate where it's adversarial, but it's conversational. I hope so. That's what what I'm hoping. That's the only reason I agreed to it, because I'm not... A debate because I see debates get really yeah. personally they at homing them attacks and all that. That's why I like when you do it. I mean, when you do your debates with mm-hmm. the atheists and that that uh, Dominican priest that you have uh-huh. on that Father comes, Pine. yeah, Father. Yeah. I mean, those are are very well done. But there's also one I've seen where it just turns into a more heat than yeah, than, more heat than substance than, than conversation. Yeah, no. you know, I mean, I think we have a conversation that you're actually listening to someone. You're mm-hmm. not thinking about what's my next argument, what's my next, but you're actually listening. Oh, you know what? And taking good things from, I could totally understand. Like, like the, the, the woman that at the pro life, oh, I yeah. could totally appreciate where you're coming from. I didn't belittle her. Mm-hmm. I didn't mock her. I took what she and acknowledged that she. There were some good things there. Your uphill battle is going to be as you try to discuss race from a Christian point of view. People feel so burnt by CRT that they may not give you a hearing. Does that make sense? Well, Jesus walked up a hill to die on it. So if I've got to walk up a hill, I'm going to do it. Simple as that. Jesus walked up hill. I'm going to walk up that hill too. And I'm not going to be afraid to do it. Yeah. Because why? I'm coming from a, a perspective of truth, goodness, and beauty. Yeah. I'm looking at the ultimate purpose, the ultimate meaning, really looking at um, the dignity of the human person. So I, I'm approaching it from a Christian anthro- anthropological perspective, not from a political, sociological, so psychological good. perspective. So good, yeah. Yeah, we're about truth, not uh, not politics, I suppose. In, uh, right, I don't, I don't want, want to politics politicize to align the issue. With truth, yeah. I don't want to politicize the issue because it's ultimately about the dignity of every single human person. Then, because, for example, there are no physical descriptions of Jesus in the, in the Gospels. Mm-hmm. You don't know what color, height, weight, because it didn't matter. Mm-hmm. What mattered was the message. Mm. And that's what we have to get across in, in the conversation today. Mm. That's awesome, man. Thank you for doing that. When's the book coming out? Some t- spring of next year, you know, it was supposed to come out earlier, but then uh, Dr. Ed Fazer has a book coming out. Fesser has a book coming out about critical race theory and Good. racism, okay. which is coming out in the fall. And because they didn't want our books. And plus, there's uh, they also said something about supply chain paper or something. So because of those two factors, they pushed the book out until the spring of next year. Mm. So now I'm, I'm excited for it to come out. Because like, I'm not trying to be the expert or the guru in this area. I'm just trying to to create a platform we can actually have a conversation about this. Thank you. Uh, and, and actually, from a Christian perspective, look at this and, and, and see Christ in everything. Mm-hmm. Thanks for doing that. The first book you put out was for men. 
What yeah, was that Behold the Man. Behold the Man, A Catholic Vision of Male Spirituality. I just remember that doing. Everybody was reading that book. That did well. Yeah, it did, it did very well. You're passionate about men's ministry? Yeah, and I think a lot of it comes from the fact of my situation with my father. Hmm. Um, you know, um, born in Barbados, my father was a very successful uh, touring musician and nightclub owner, hmm. and he lived like one. So when we um, left to come to the United States, my father did not come with us. It was my mother, my grandmother, and my, and my little brother. And the four of us came to the States. My mother was a cardiac care nurse, and she worked at a hospital for 30 years, Beth Israel Hospital in Newark. And uh, my father didn't join us till about a year after that. Um, and when he did, you know, we learned quickly that he loved basically three things, womenizing, alcohol, and cigarettes. Um, so my father... Um, has about 15 other kids from other women that we know of. Um, you know, some of my relatives tell me there's more than that, mm -hmm. but we can document 15. And um, he also liked drink, you know. So, I mean, so, uh, and then we became a strain. After they got divorced, that there's a surprise there, right? Um, and I get often asked by young people, what's it like to be a child of divorce? And, and I tell them that marriage is a beautiful thing. It really is, but it's also the cross. Mm -hmm. And divorce is when the parents put the cross down and the kids pick it up, right? And that's not a place you ever want to be. And so after divorce, I still maintained a respectful relationship with my dad until I joined the Benedictines. And when I when I was going to enter monastic life, I didn't my, know this about you. Yeah, my father did not understand that at all. <laughs> it's the opposite. He and I went to see him at his apartment mm. out of respect because he's my father to tell him what I thought I'd be doing for the rest of my life. And our conversation went like, you're going to do what? You're the first person in our family ever to go to college. You go to Notre Dame. He used to brag to his friends. My son went to Notre Dame. You get an economics and business degree, and now you're going to waste your life living with a bunch of men? What's wrong with you? I'm not supposed to tell my friends. I told him he could tell his friends. <laughs> and then I didn't speak to him for 18 years. Yeah. As far as I was concerned, on that day he died. He was dead to me. And so we did have reconciliation, you know, uh, 18 years later, uh, which is a whole nother story. Um, but but I so I when I left monastic life and um, was heading on the path toward marriage, I did not know how to be a father. Um, my mother made sure that there were male figures in my life, not to take the place of my dad, but to show me authentic uh, maleness. Uh, one of them was my scout master, uh, Dr. Alan H. Tobe, who's a podiatrist. He lived in, in the suburbs, but came every Monday into the hood to be with his boys, his sons. Yeah, and uh, I love that man. He was amazing. He's a Jewish doctor, but our scout Sunday, and, and man, he'd be in the, we'd be in the front row, the scouts, the first two pews. He'd be there proud as anything. Showing off his scouts, his boys, man, you know, and scout. Oh, he was just, mm. he was an amazing, an amazing, amazing man. The only one was my wrestling coach, uh, Mike DiPiano, senior, who's now retired down in, down in Florida um, with his wife, Michelle, but um, oh, with, with Karen, his daughter's Michelle, Karen is his wife. And uh, he was a huge influence on me as well. And I, I mentioned both of them in my book, mm. in the acknowledgments in, in, in the book. Um, you know, they, they, they even helped me believe in me when I didn't even believe in myself. You know, it was, it was a, a just awesome male relationships. Um, and, but still when it came to marriage, I'm like, I don't know how to do this. Like I always thought I was going to be a monk. I didn't have to worry about, you know, wife and father and all that kind of stuff. So I've been thinking about these issues for a long time. And then, um, I was approached by EWTN about doing a, uh, television series for men called Behold the Man. And so it started out as a, as a television series. It was a 13 episode thing. Um, it debuted in like 2006. And uh, then they quickly asked me to do more series. Now I have nine series on the network. But um, after I left my, my career and started speaking and writing full time in 2012, Mark Brumley, who was one of my adjunct professors hmm. in, in graduate school at the University of Dallas, um, approached me about writing a book for them. I said, I'm not an author. I don't, know write, I don't know how to write a book. What are you talking about? He goes, well, let's just talk about it. So we, I, I, I met with them and kicked around some ideas. Um, 
And uh, I yeah, went down to California. They took me to dinner and all this wine and all this stuff. And I didn't drink, but I was, you know. <laughs> and um, so we talked about and And behold, the man rose to the top because I don't remember seeing a book. I, I remember seeing books that talk from a Catholic perspective, talking about aspects of male spirituality, you know, uh, pornography, virtue, mm -hmm. fatherhood, good stuff. But I didn't see anything that looked at the theology that under undergirded what it means to be an authentically Catholic man. So I started looking at church documents, couldn't find any. Now, um, Quam Quam uh, 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 Redentoris Custus, which is John Paul II's document on St. Joseph on the 100th anniversary of Quam Quam Plurius on St. Joseph, um, talks about St. Joseph, but not particularly about male spirituality. Um, uh, Familiaris Consortio, uh, uh, on the family in the modern world, talks about fatherhood but not particularly male spirituality but yet he wrote mulier signitatem on the dealing vocation of women beautiful theology of femininity and womanhood I'm like dang where's the one for men mm. and well there was there was none and so i said okay let me do this so i i i wrote the book basing it on john paul's two anthropology applied to a male spirituality so the, the hermeneutics are john paul's two's anthropology and the saint paul's theology of the cross were the kind of the foundation. Like if you talk about the hierarchy of truths in Catholic faith, right? You have the Trinity, Incarnation, mm -hmm. and Grace, and every sacramental life, everything is built on those foundation. So my foundation was John Paul II, uh, theology, Paul's Theology of the Cross as a mm -hmm. the, the foundation for building up everything else that I wrote in that book. Can you make sure we put a link in the description below to that book? Mm -hmm. um, Behold the Man, you got it in there it's already? already there, yeah. Please go buy that book, everybody, right now. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, yeah. Mm, if you could sum that up, how do you be a Catholic man? Probably difficult to sum up. So, well, well, basically, well, actually, let me let me let me do it like this. Given um, the conversation you had with Abigail, yeah, uh, last a couple weeks ago, um, who I, who I talked about before the show, I'm obsessed with. Her. Not obsessed, bro. I want get I get the wrong idea. Like, She's Nick, what are you talking about? Yeah. See, I mean, I I came across her by accident, and then when I started googling more talks about her, I came across. Her first talk with on you with Pines on Aquinas, and I saw the one just a couple weeks ago, and I just watched the whole thing. I was like eating and dinner, like ah, you know. I just, can't, I mean, she's just amazing. Mm. So, so I would say to be an authentically Catholic man is to is to live Paul's theology of the cross. So in Genesis chapter two, it says God put man in the garden to to till and to keep. Actually, it. it uh, um, the man, the word for man is Adam in Hebrew, but in Genesis two it says the man, ha Adam, ha Adam, the man. So a definite article is there. So he's talking about a specific male. He says your job is to uh, to till and to keep the garden, right? So the word till is abad in Hebrew. That means a work in the form of service, and to keep is shamar, which means to protect and defend. So the man is put in the garden and he's given his mission and his purpose and his calling by God as a man. Serve, protect, and defend everything I am entrusting to you. Hmm. Right? So that's the basic foundation. Well, Adam failed. Right? When it came time to actually do that, when Satan was tempting his wife and, 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 and leading her consciousness to sin, he stood there and said and did nothing. Now, now in the English translation, the scripture says, who was with her, right? But in the Hebrew, it's not there. So how do we know he was there mm. during his conversation with Satan? You know how, um, if I were to say, hey, you, who am I talking to? The person in front of you? Or a group of people. I see. Right? In English, so we, use this, we use the same <laughs> word, right? In other languages, they have different use for the different contexts. So for example, in Spanish, if I say two, that's you. If I say vosotros... You. So it's like y'all right? and all y'all. Right, right, right. So in, in Hebrew, it's the same. So when it goes, you will not die for when you eat of it, your eyes will open, you will be like God. It's plural. <laughs> oh, is that right? In Hebrew. So he's talking about both. Now in English, we can't get that sense across. So yeah. they had to add in English, who <laughs> was with her. I see. I okay. see this show that he was there. Yeah. That means he said and did nothing mm -hmm. while Satan destroyed his family right out from under him. He stood there and did nothing. Right? So that's what's so awesome about St. Joseph. St. Joseph says nothing, but his actions spoke louder than his words. Everything God asked to do, he did faithfully without saying a word. Right? So you, you move that to, to Paul's theology now. For example, you, the Ephesians 5, you guys talk, you talk about that with mm -hmm. Abigail. 
Now, I would say, like, you know, uh, the pericope starts in verse 21. Uh, be, sub- be subject to one another out of out of uh, uh, be subject to one out of the reverence for Christ, which which yeah, I, I I think you cannot look at Ephesians five without understanding Genesis two. You have to understand what's going on in Genesis two to appreciate what Paul is doing in Ephesians five. So let's look quickly let's quickly through Genesis two. So he has the man, and then he says, it's "Not good for the man to be alone." John Paul two says the man was created in a state of original solitude. So what does he understand? In that original solitude, he's greater than all the other creatures that God created because he puts him in charge of all of them. Mm -hmm. He is self-aware and conscious. He is aware of himself. He can know himself. He's also aware of God and can have relationship with God. But but what's the left? He has no one to share it with. So God says it's not good for the man to be alone. Why? Because we're made in the image and likeness of God. God exists as a family as a communion of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So man by himself makes no sense. In fact, the word Adam does not mean male in Hebrew. That is Ish and Isha. Like in mm. Genesis 1, uh, it says uh, Adam, male and Ish and Isha, he created them. So out of the Adam, the fullness of humanity, Ish and Isha, male and female. So the equality between man and woman is showed in Genesis 1 by creating them uh, at the same time. Although the woman is created last what to, well, that's really important i'll talk about that in a second so so what does he do he doesn't start with another lump of clay right with another because adam adam by the adam by the way adam is a play on the word for dirt dust or soil in hebrew adama mm. so he takes the adam out of the adama the dirt dust or soil <clears throat> that's beautiful why because how do we remember this as catholics in a very powerful way every year ash wednesday, ash wednesday. remember that you are Mm. Adama and to the Adama Adam shall return. Wow. Beautiful connection there. So he doesn't start with no, instead, he puts a man into a deep sleep, right? And and while he takes he takes out a rib, builds up a woman, and brings her to the man. The guy wakes up. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Right? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, right? What's what's going on here? First of all, he puts the man into a deep sleep, teradema in Hebrew, deep sleep, teradema. Okay. It's a deep sleep without consciousness or dreams. And whenever you see that word used, uh, for example, it's used in um, First uh, Samuel when uh, you know David and Saul are having this. You know, Saul's trying to kill David, and, and then um, David goes into the camp. With one of his soldiers, takes the, the spear and the water jug. And the guy said, let me thrust him through. I don't need a second thrust, right? And he goes, no, just that's our king. We have to respect him. He's chosen by God. Leave him there. And he comes back. Was, they said they were putting into a deep sleep. That's the same word that's used there, terima. It's used in Job. It's used in Exodus. It's used in a couple of other places. Whenever you see that word used, when they wake up, God does something amazing. For example, when everybody woke up, Saul and the men woke up, the, the feud between David and, 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 and Saul was over. Right? So God does something amazing out of that terror them on. And he said he takes a rib. Now, in Hebrew, the word is not rib. It's selah. It literally, in Hebrew, says he takes his side and created her. Now, now, why in English would we substitute the word rib when the word rib is not there in Hebrew? Very simply this. If we were to say side, what do you mean? Left side? Right side? Side of fries? Right? <laughs> side can mean a lot of things in English. But if you say selah in Hebrew, they knew that it meant this. From from the side, so what's your the the equality? Mm-hmm. This is Aquinas. Man woman, you know, this, from the side. Aquinas makes this very point. Oh, there you go. He says if if she was taken from the head, she would lord over yes, him. Yes, yes. Taken from the foot, man would yes. lord over her. Yes, exactly. So he's created for military the, the the equal. Now, what's beautiful about that picture, Matt? Think about it. Jesus Christ on the cross is in the terror de ma, the sleep of death. Remember, mm. Christ always refers to death as sleep. Remember when the 12 year old girl died? Mm-hmm. He, oh, she's sleeping. She's dead. No, she's just asleep. And they, they, it's like, Jesus, we're not stupid. We know what dead is. She's dead. And he kicked everybody else, Peter, James, John, and the parents. He said, Talita Kum, that little girl, arise. Like mm. if she was asleep, woke her up. When he went to raise Lazarus, what did he say to his, the apostles? Let's mm-hmm. go wake our brother. So there's Jesus in the terror de ma, the sleep of death on the cross. And Longinus spears him in the side. What comes out? Blood, and, Blood water. and water, right? So St. John Chrysostom, other fathers of the church would say, water for baptism, 
bl- uh, blood for the Eucharist. The church is born from the side of Christ. The bride comes forth from the side of the bridegroom on the cross. And see, we see that, you know, a uh, pre- uh, prelude of that in Genesis chapter 2. Right? Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Then he says, at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Why is he looking to say, man, she's hot? <laughs> right? Why does he say that? In Semitic languages like Hebrew and Aramaic, there are no superlative words. Mm-hmm. So we use words like the greatest, the best, the mm-hmm. most to describe something to the highest or greatest degree. Because they don't have words like that, they they one of two things in Hebrew. They use a prepositional, they uh well, they, they said something three times. So for example, the sound is at mass. We we took we took that from our Jewish brothers and sisters. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord, Lord because yeah. God gets the highest degree of holiness right. three times. Um or to use a prepositional phrase. So in First Timothy or Book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Lord. So he's the greatest of all kings mm. and the Lord of all lords. So now the man looks upon the woman, right, who was created from his side, someone who is also created in the same solid, original solitude as him, mm-hmm. except she has curves and bumps and stuff. <laughs> so here's someone, he's looking at someone who... Not only is equal to him, but compliments him. Mm. That, in an earthly sense, perfects him. Now, because remember, the, all the relationships are looking toward final relationship with Christ, ultimately in heaven. But this is uh, presuppose on um, an earthly way. She perfects him. She completes him. She perfectly compliments him. So he says, "This is his bone of my bone, flesh of my. She's the greatest of my bone. She's the greatest of my flesh. She is the greatest part of who I am." That's what he's saying. Then he says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. The word for cling is daubach, which means to pursue as to overtake. Hmm. Wait a minute. A man leaves his father and mother and pursues his wife? Yes. Why? The woman is the greatest of all God's creation. She is the cherry on the whipped cream of the ice cream of God's creative activity. She's not created second after the man. She's created last God saved his best work for last why because a woman has a special intimacy with the Holy Spirit right we pray every Sunday cradle et spiritus sanctus dominum et vivi ficantem I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver of life life so a woman has a special intimacy with the Holy Spirit um, as a life giver and a life bearer by the very nature of how God created her right so she can participate in the intimacy of bearing life in a way that we men can't. Mm -hmm. So that's why Satan went after her first. He's the author of death. So he goes after the one who gives life. Not because she was weaker than him or she was less. She went after because she's the one that gives life and he's the author of death. So that's why he goes after her first. And it was his job to stand up and serve, protect, and defend her and he didn't do it. And that's how we got sin and all that kind of stuff and that's why jesus had to come back that's why jesus refers to the bridegroom and the bride revelation 19 verse 9 blessed are those who are called to the wedding supper or wedding feast of the lamb where christ the eternal bride groom will be giving life to his bride forever in heaven the church that's anticipated by the church right now in our relationship with christ and, and the eucharist and and in, and in sacramental marriage all right now think about a couple little pictures here you got married right you're married mm-hmm. just like i am um, 16 years this year. Yeah. M- right. Remember, remember your wedding day? Mm-hmm. You, Very stood, much. you stood at the altar. Everybody mm-hmm. said, nice tux. <laughs> right? But then what happened? <laughs> then everyone turned around. Everybody turned, the, the <laughs> ring bearers of the flower girls and all the people. And then, then it was silence in heaven. Yeah. Like, like the book of Revelation broke yeah. the seventh seal. And then, dun, ba, da, 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 she came in. Everybody stood up. Oh my God. She's so beautiful. Oh, look at that. Oh my God. She's a, and the whole thing, you're standing going, this is really happening. This is really happening. This is really happening, right? Yeah. And everybody, tell me I'm lying. The whole mass, everybody's looking at her. Yeah. No, you're not lying. Everybody's mm-hmm. looking at her. Right, she's got the dresses. She's beautiful, and they're like, "Oh, like, I mean, it's something about the feminine that's awesome." Now think about this: who brings her down the aisle? The Father, father. God, the Father gave Eve to Adam in the garden. The Father of the bride gives and entrusts his daughter to her new husband. Mm-hmm. God does the same thing in the garden. So we, we even say that in our, in our Catholic religion, the giving away. Mm. Why do we do that? Because that's what God did. God the Father entrusting. So I've beautiful. never made that connection before. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. And so he pursued, what is he pursuing? 
He's pursuing she which perfects him and perfectly and, and, and in an earthly way, right? In an earthly way, perfects him, completes him, com perfectly complements him, yeah. right? And once he pursues her and, and attains her, then he puts her behind. You want to get to her? You got to come through me. Serve, protect, and defend. Goes back to, again to Genesis, the original uh, calling by man, by God. Yeah. So now you can understand Ephesians 5. Right? Because it's rooted in covenant relationship. So that's why it starts off verse 21, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ, mm -hmm. referring to the covenant relationship of from the side, mm -hmm. created equally by God. Then it says, wives, be submissive to your husbands. The word for submissive is hupatasso in Greek. Now, hupatasso is a military word that was used by Roman soldiers to describe troops arranged in divisions that placed themselves under the mission and direction of a leader who was typically a general. Mm hmm because what remember St. Paul understands remember in the next chapter Ephesians 6 he mm -hmm. described the armor of God yeah black breastplate of righteousness sword of spirit helmet of salvation shod your feet with the gospel of peace he understands the Roman soldier's uniform so in using that word wives place yourselves under your husband's mission what is his mission Ephesians 5.25 mm -hmm. husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church how did Christ show his love for the church mm -hmm. died for he her. died for her mm-hmm he gave his life for her. Mm -hmm. So what is our job as men? To die. When we said that altar, not you just, you said I do, but what you really meant was I die. You die to your ego. You die to everything that separates you from intimate, personal, loving, life in relationship with, with Christ. And you give your complete self in love and service without losing yourself. Right? Because some people say, oh, I lost myself in him. I lost myself in her. That's not what covenant relationship is. You don't lose yourself. You find yourself. Because mm. your spouse helps you to become more of the person who God created you to be, not less. You don't lose yourself. You find yourself. Mm -hmm. And so in that relationship, then Ephesians 5, he dies to everything that separates himself so that he can. The reason why you thought and I, this is a very interesting conversation you have with Abigail um, the, about the headship. Mm -hmm. The man is the head. Because he's not the boss, he's the chief servant. That's why he's the head. Because Christ gives us the model. I have not come to be served, but mm -hmm, to, serve. to serve. The mm -hmm. greatest among you is the least, least yeah. is the servant of all. And, and not the synoptic gospel, but in John gospel, he washes the feet. Why does he do that? Two reasons. Mm -hmm. Exodus 30 and 40 was one of the ways he instituted the priesthood. Before the when the priest offered the sacrifice, he went from the tent of meeting to the altar of sacrifice. In between was a laver, a big bowl where he washed his hands and his feet. Only the priest did that, not the Levite. Okay, because the Levite was the, the deacon, right? Mm -hmm. Was the one who served the priest. Very clear. The, de the the Levite doesn't wash, only the high priest and the priests washed. Then they went to offer the sacrifice. They washed their hands and their feet. So one of the reasons why he washed their feet was instituting the priesthood. The other mm, reason, it was something only a slave did. Wash the feet. He was given the model of how they're supposed to lead the church. Headship and leadership and authority is rooted in service. That's how you're supposed to lead. And that's how we're supposed to lead our families. Amen. That's powerful. What are, let's talk about pornography. I know you've addressed this. this I, just, Matt, I'm not kidding you. I'm not doing this just for the show. Literally, just this morning, I can show you the email. I got an email from a guy who I've been working with to overcome porn. He was doing great. Then he has some stresses in his life, some struggles. He's got a surgery coming up, and he went and he fell back into porn again. And I have recommended you to him and your resource to him. And that's re it's really, really helped him. But he had mm -hmm. a setback. Yeah. So he needed a little bit of encouragement. He goes, oh, I was doing great for months, and now all of a sudden, I, is that normal to have a setback? I'm like, oh, yes, it's normal to have a setback. Mm -hmm. But here's what you need to do next. So I'm glad we're talking about this because it was just this wow. morning was very relevant. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it is demonic that the pinnacle of creation ought to be turned into one of the lowest things in creation to woo us. Um, That's what Satan has to do. And it's he what has it, to destroy. And this is, I, I, yeah. love, I love how Jason Everett puts it, that pornography emasculates men. It robs them of the ability to be masculine. So I no longer go to you, my bride, to give of my strength. I go to you to take from you, to subordinate your good to the inferior good of my pleasure. Exactly. Because pleasure is not a bad thing. Okay? Pleasure is one of the things that God gives at a very a very base, a very ephemeral level that 
raises our minds and hearts to God in a very base way. So, for example, my wife loves chocolate. I don't know many women who don't. Yeah, that's there true. are probably a few out there, but you know, <laughs> but many. most of them love chocolate. So I give my <laughs> wife chocolate. She goes, oh, oh God, that's good, <laughs> right? Because the pleasure of that chocolate raises our minds. Are you cut into a good steak? Well, mm. before I was doing the plant based <laughs> thing, right? Oh God, that's good, right? Yeah. Very platonic, right? Yes. So that so pleasure is not a bad thing, but what Satan does, he takes pleasure out of its proper context of a means to an end. He takes it out and brings it to the culture and elevates it now as an end in itself. Pleasure is now your God. Pleasure is now your end, your purpose, and your meaning. See, that that's a huge problem. That's a massive problem. Um, and you're right. In a matter, let me give you an example. I gave a homily once against contraception, but it was it was very again the truth and love. I didn't attack anybody. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I said, "Well, here's the beauty of the church's understanding of this." After mass, a guy came up to me, and goes, "Deacon, can I talk to you?" He said, "Sure." He goes, "Not here." I'm like, "Okay." So I got my vest, went to the rectory, sat down. What's going on? I didn't like your homily. Which part? All of it. Okay. Um, well, what, what's what's uh, why should what's I going care on? about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, what's going? On? I don't want to tell anybody to tell me what to do with my body and that kind of stuff. Is da, 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 da. I said, tell me about your relationship with your wife. And he paused. I said, things not going well. He goes, well, she don't have she don't want to have sex anymore. I said, oh, that's not good. I said, and so I, I was empathizing. I said, well, 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 tell me what's going what's going on. What, what what's what's happening? Are you using contraception? And then he said, oh, here we go. See, this is what I'm talking about, Deacon. He goes, see, the, the church is stuck in the Middle Ages. You know, the church needs to come up, come uh, 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 follow the times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, that's so antiquated, out of date. You know, every, look, all those people you preach, they're all contraceptive. You know, I, I, I said, my friend, I asked you a yes or no question. He goes, yeah, I'm using contraception. So what? I said, we'll, we'll get back to that. Tell me about this, the, the, what's going on with your wife. Uh, tell me about the last time this happened. So he said, well, you know, we were, had dinner. The kids were gone and you know, had, had dinner. And then a little while after dinner, I made some advances. I, 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 got, I got you. And I said, what happened? She goes, well, I don't want to have sex with you right now. So I'm waiting for the rest of it. Mm. And he's not saying anything. I said, that's it? He said, yes. And you're angry. Yes. Let me see if I understand this. Did your wife say to you, I don't love you anymore? No. Did your wife say to you, I don't ever want to have sex with you ever again? No. You said that she said, I don't want to have sex with you right now. Did you say, okay, baby, what about an hour from now? You even give her that much? No. That's just why are you angry? disappointed I can see right but why are you so angry and he couldn't tell me I said let me tell you why you're angry because love and life are two things that never intend to be separated by God now I'm not saying that you're supposed to have as many children as, as humanly possible that, that the church doesn't teach that right but you're supposed to be open to life in fact if you look at in Genesis 1 that's the, in, in a sense that's the first commandment it goes mm -hmm. be fruitful and multiply Ephrata in, in Aramaic but para means be open. Like literally, it means to be open. So literally in Hebrew, if God's first command is be open to life. So love, he created out of love and then right away life. Psalm 119 verse 88, because of your love, give me life and I will do your will. Love, life, fulfillment of God's will. So what you've done by using contraception, you forced a wedge in between love and life, two things that never tend to be separated. And when you've separated, it doesn't matter what you're using a condom, diaphragm, pill. Mm. It it creates this chasm in this void. And as human beings, we don't like to have those spaces within ourselves, those emptiness within ourselves. So you're trying to fill it with what do we work, alcohol, drugs, in your case, pornography. So here's what you did. And I told him, I took my wallet out and I slammed it on the table. I said, I bet you everything in my wallet right now. How did you know he was looking at pornography? Did you just say? You I just, I just, no, no, yeah, or... I just assume, right? Okay. I said, here's what you did. And I took my wallet out, right? And I slammed it on the table. I said, I put you everything in my wallet right now. That after that happened, you went to your bedroom, you took care of things yourself, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Let me tell you why you do that, why you did that. 
because your wife is now your whore. I said, what you've done, it doesn't matter whether it's her, your hand, another woman. It doesn't matter what it is because all you want is pleasure. Pleasure is now your God. And now it doesn't. And now your wife is just now you see her something that gives you pleasure. You don't see her the way God sees her. You don't look at her through God's eyes. You don't see what God sees when he looks at her. You just look at her as someone that gives you pleasure. And when she didn't give you what you want, you were like a little boy who can't get dessert first before before dinner. You just got mad. Huh? And he looked at me. He's like, he was just like, whoa, 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 whoa. And they, so he started trying to say something back to me. Well, what do you what do you and your wife do? I said, brother, we just go for it. And whatever happens, happens. But when we're disciplined, we use natural family planning. He said, what's that? <laughs> so I had to explain through the Billings Ovulation Method. He goes, what happens if your wife's not into it? Right? And I said, okay. I, I said, I'll give you a real life situation, brother. Um, when I come back from overseas, I'm gone for 10 days, two weeks at a time. I'm ready. You know, and so I'm, 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 I'm unpacking my dirty clothes in the bathroom, like tonight, tonight, da, 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 da. you know, and I'm, uh, I'm thinking, and now I look in the garbage can. Oh, you've got to be kidding me, man. That's going on now. Ugh, so now I got to wait another week. So what do I do in that situation? I'm hyped up, right? I'm thinking this whole thing and I can't have sex with my wife. What do I do? There's two things I got. I can go to my computer and take care of things myself like you did. Or here's what I did. In my office, on the Just floor, to be clear, when he's saying like you did, he's referring to the men in his office. Yeah, right, not you, man. I, I just want to be real clear. Yeah, yeah. Keep, keep so in my office, you can see all the books, right? But on the floor, because I don't have room on the shelves for this, I have the complete uh, uh, Summa Theological by St. Thomas Aquinas in Latin and English, okay? Mm. I pull out one of the volumes of the Summa and I just start reading. Because reading St. Thomas Aquinas will kill any sexual <laughs> desire you have in your body. <laughs> it works, my friend. Trust me, it works, it works, right? Uh, and I told him I'd rather do that than to turn my wife into a thing, into an object, to strip her of her humanity and her dignity as a woman. Mm -hmm. Because every day of my life as her husband and the father of her children, I want her, I want to see her the way God sees her. I want to see every woman the way God sees her. That's why I will never contracept. Mm. And that was the beginning of our discussion, of our dialogue. How did it end? Well, it en ended pretty quickly after that because he said he had to go. Uh -huh. But I said, I am here. If you want to talk more about this, I am more than happy to, to talk with you about this. Whatever questions you have, please feel free to come to me. Yeah. You know, and, and I just left it like that. Yeah. You know, again, not I, agree, I, agree, I, I won. No, 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 no. It's not about that. How do I get this person in front of me to want to listen to more of what I have to say? Mm. That's the key. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm tracking with you. How do you balance the uh, aggressive approach that you say that you do and that you kind of exhibited in a playful way then with the tenderness that's required. Because one of the things I love about Jose Maria Escriva is he kicks you directly in the stomach. <laughs> yeah. He talks to you like you're a man. He, Jordan Peterson has this effect as well. He knows that you're capable of being better than the way you are, and so he speaks to you in that way. How do you thread that needle? Yeah, so for me, it's about listening. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I try to do is first, before I say anything, is to listen. I want to hear where this person is coming from. Now, of course, it's going to be, and now how I listen to them, is it a man, is it a woman, where they are in their faith journey right now, are they going to church, they're not going to church, are they, I see. where are they with their sex? I'm trying to listen so I can craft a way of responding for that individual person at that time. Yeah. For Again, not trying, this is just an initial conversation. I'm not trying to change their mind, I'm not trying, it's just an initial conversation. So what, what can I say to meet this person where they are, Right? To meet them where they are and, and hopefully begin a dialogue that will, that will lead to further discussion, further introspection, um, uh, uh, ultimately to a deeper love of Christ is, is ultimately yeah. where I want to help people to get to a deeper love of Christ. Yeah, because out of that, once yeah, you out have of that, that relationship. Then we have, yeah, then, so, so I leave them thinking, okay, well, that raised a bunch of more questions for me. And then they come back. That raised even more questions for me. And then they come back. You see? But they, they, keep, they keep coming back. Mm. And I think that's the key, is that respectful dialogue. We're actually listening to each other, um, where we're trying to understand where each other is coming from in the search for ultimately what is true. You know, I was thinking, you know, a cure for this sort of 
uh, effeminacy. You know, it's funny, Aquinas uses the word eff effeminate, although, of course, there's a Latin equivalent, which is essentially meaning softness. That's what, when he says a man is being effeminate, he's, he's saying a man isn't doing the thing he ought to do because of his duty. I think pornography is one way of making you soft. There are other ways. But I think devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary is a great antidote to that. Not only are, as you say, women the pinnacle of creation, but she's the pinnacle of creation, creation. You know, she's the pinnacle, pinnacle, the pinnacle, pinnacle, pinnacle. Well, absolutely. And think about it, Matt. I mean, God starts to plan with the Blessed Virgin Mary in Genesis. Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelium, right? Mm -hmm. Or the first gospel. I enmity. What, what enmity means uh, opposition. But in uh, Hebrew, it's ebau, which means hatred. So literally it says I'll put hatred between, but I think mm. that's a little bit too strong like for the it. translators. But I yeah. know, but they put so they put enmity. It was yeah. opposition between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Now, how do we know that the woman being spoken of there is Mary? Because think about it, Genesis three is the first three chapters of the Bible. There's only one woman, that's Eve. So and the, and the, and the uh, God's given the punishment to Satan between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. But of course, it must be Eve. You know, just the only woman. How do we know it's not Eve? Here's three clues for me. One, the punishment involves two people, the woman and the snake, but God's only talking to one of them. So, for example, uh, we have a rule in our house when the twins were younger, right? Because it rains a lot in Oregon, right? So uh, you can't play ball outside when it's raining. So I said, we have a rule in the house, no ball playing in the house. I was in uh, the bedroom. I heard crash. I came downstairs. The lamp that was by the television was falling over and the floor broken. There was a ball on the floor. There are the twins. <laughs> Who did it? They're pointing at each other. He did it. She did it. He did it. She did it. Who did I punish? I don't know. Both. Okay. Punish both of them. Right? So in Genesis, if the, if the punishment involves a snake and a woman, why is God only talking to the snake? If the punishment involves, and if you think the woman is he, why is he not talking to both of them? If the punishment involves both of them. Mm. So the woman, so I'm the, that's my first clue. And by the way, snake, the word in Hebrew is nahash, mm -hmm. which means monster. Uh, also used in um, other parts of scripture is leviathan. Some mm -hmm. is, is, is translated as leviathan, but it's a monster. It's not like a little garden snake wrapped around a tree that we sometimes see in medieval art. And by the way, the the fruit, everybody, this is an apple. The, the, the Bible does describe what, what the fruit is, but in Jewish, if you look at the Talmud and stuff, it's a pomegranate actually is what the, what they think the fruit would have been. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's, that's an aside. Um, so, um, in, in, in this whole way of, of, of thinking about, oh, I'm losing my train of thought. He's talking to Gen in Genesis. Yeah, so, he's the so, 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 so that's my first clue. He's only talking to, to the snake and not talking to both of them. Mm. Second, he calls her the woman. Now, remember I said, when you want to say something important, how many times do you say it? Three times. Three times, okay? So let's look. Wedding Feast of Cana. Mm. Jesus is there with some apostles, some disciples, Blessed Mother is there, and they ran out of wine, right? Now, Middle Eastern hospitality, you ran out of, oh, that's a big deal. I mean, Middle Eastern hospitality is, 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 is paramount. So the Blessed Mother's embarrassed for the family. She goes to her son, they have no wine. And Jesus' answer seems disrespectful. Well, woman, what is this between you and me? Like, woman, I, I, I imagine my son, Benjamin. <laughs> Colleen says, clean your room. Benjamin says, woman, what is this between you? Ooh, oh, oh. Benjamin, you in trouble, <laughs> right? Don't come to me because you did this to yourself, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's disrespectful. So on the surface, it sounds like what Jesus is saying is disrespectful. I don't, that's not what's going on at all. The Blessed Mother is asking him to do something supernatural, so he refers to her by her supernatural name, woman, referring back to Genesis, mm -hmm. right? That's first clue. Second, on the cross, he gives care of his mother to John. He says, woman, here is your son. Mm -hmm. Son, here is your mother. Not only is he, he, was he doing supernatural, he's entrusting the care of the church, of which Mary's the archetype, trusting the care of the church to the apostles. So he calls her woman, supernatural again. Third one, Revelation 12, 1. The woman mm -hmm. with the crown of 12 stars around her head, clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, pregnant. Duh, mm -hmm. that's Mary, right? So, oh, um, how many times? Three mm. times. Third and biggest clue, between your seed and her seed. Hmm, interesting. Who's the one that provides a seed in a relationship? Mm -hmm. Men. The man. 
But it, Hebrew clearly, her seed. I only know one woman that provided the seed, the complete human nature for her child, and that was mm -hmm. Mary. Mm -hmm. So right there, God sets a plan in motion, right? He say, he, what, he say, what he's saying to Satan is this. You use the woman to be a vehicle to bring sin into the world. I'm going to use the blessed of, most blessed of all women to be a vehicle to bring salvation into the world. So he's using the greatest of his creation to be a vehicle to bring salvation. God, what? That's awesome. Mm. And That's we should point awesome. out too that this was understood by the early church. This yes. isn't like medieval inventions right, or reading correct. into it too enthusiastically. Right. And see, and this is Saint some Justin of the things Martin that under that. Exactly. This is one of the things that underpin our understanding of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We don't worship her, right? We don't give her um, uh, latria, right? Mm -hmm. That, that word's only to God. But we honor her because of the role that she played in salvation history. You know, she's she's awesome. Mm -hmm. And I think that every priest, even though they're celibate, has to have an intimate relationship with the Blessed Mother if they're going to have a, a, a fruitful priesthood. You know, there's, there's no question in my mind about that. I mean, I love praying the rosary every day. Sometimes I pray on the plane, you know, and so I'm not embarrassed to pray the rosary in front of whatever. You know, I mean, and, and, and again, um, reflecting on the mysteries of our salvation through the heart of the Blessed Mother, you know, because our soul was pierced so that the thoughts of many hearts may be laid there, mm. you know, so she understands what it's like to lose someone that you love, someone that you are part, physically part of, you know, she understands that pain, you know, and she was there and saw it and saw it happen, you know, so, so when we're going through something, you know, we can look at it through the eyes and the heart of the Blessed Mother. You know, it's, it's that, that relationship we have with her is so beautiful. Someone I've been reading more and more is St. Maximilian Kolbe. He had two doctorates. He never wrote systematically, right. but in his letters, he outlines a lot of beautiful things about the Blessed Mother. And one thing I love that he does is he essentially stands before her and asks a question, who are you? Like, who are you? He says, I don't even know what it means to be a creature of God, much less an adopted son of God. Like, what does that mean? I can't comprehend it. This is beyond me. So then who are you, mother? of God, spouse of the Holy Spirit, you know, daughter of God the Father. He says, you're not God, I know that. You're not Eve, I know that. You're not an angel. Who are you? Like the, the absolute awe we should have in front of the one who gave milk to our bread, to quote Augustine, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Amazing. All right, well, look, we've got questions that are flying in from people here. Would you mind if we took yeah, some of them? Yeah, sure. All right. I want to apologize in advance to everybody because there's no way we're going to get through all of these. But before I get to these questions, I need to say thank you to Hallo, who is a sponsor. You know what Hallo is? Familiar? Yes, great app. Fantastic app. Best Catholic app out there unless I come up with one one day and then mine will be. But until then, <laughs> Hallo.com slash Matt Frad. Hallo.com slash Matt Frad. If you want to get better at praying daily, meditating, listening to beautiful audio books and all that, go check out Hallo, H-A-L-L-O-W dot com slash Matt Click the link in the description below. When you do that, you'll get three months free. So you can try it out and decide if you want to continue by paying a small amount monthly. My wife and I use this. I use it every day. They have beautiful Gregorian chant. The lo-fi music I came up with is on there. So that's cool. Check them out. Hallow.com slash Matt Frad. Hallow.com slash Matt Frad. Now, I'm going to start asking these questions. I haven't read them ahead of time. We'll see what happens. Is that okay? So um, Mindala says, Deacon Burke Sivers Never change. You rock. This was a brilliant way to handle that protester. Good. Uh, Nick says, I have a few Catholic friends very grounded in faith who defend certain more Christian sounding interpretations of critical race theory as applies to race, gender and class. Could you give your best argument for critical race theory from a Christian perspective or steel man it and then respond to that argument? This is a great point because Aquinas does this all the time. He gives the best interpretation of his opponent's argument, then he shows why it fails, as opposed to straw manning it and then easily knocking it down. Right, right. So, uh, gosh, I guess I would say that, um, and I'm anticipating this and, 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 and for the debate that's coming up with this, whoever this person is, that's going to be um, supporting mm -hmm. critical race theory. Um, so... I, I, I would say that um, because critical race theory tries to address the changing of structures in society, right? So uh, I think that they would argue that we have certain structures that are in society that are um, 
inherently uh, view other people um, uh, or they are inherently racist. These structures and these uh, institutions that were in our culture and society are inherently racist. So therefore, we have to critique, right? Critique that in light of race in order to um, see. But ultimately, I don't know what the ultimate goal of critical race theory is because it's not the Christian perspective to bring mm. people together. It's to create a new synthesis, which is what. I love that you're asking See, the question because th- th- that's, that's, that's what, what you I, want to do in this debate. Yeah, you want to because have a that's what I don't understand. Like, what is what the is ultimate yeah. goal of critical race theory? And remember, we're talking about it's a theory, right? So we, people tell like it's critical race fact, but it's just mm. it's just a theory. Um, so I don't understand what the ultimate purpose because for me, the ultimate end of purpose of racism is to close the racial divide and develop a deeper understanding and seeing each other made in God's image and likeness. I have not seen anything like that from critical race theory. To me. Again, because of the conflict and tension and struggle, it just creates more division. Fair enough. And more, so I don't. So I don't really understand what the ultimate end or purpose of what it, of what it's supposed to be. Because it's not to bring people together. Yeah. Well, that'll be a good question for you to ask in That's your dialogue. Gonna, yeah. And I love yeah. that, right? You're not going pretending you have all the answers. You're trying to learn from right. this person. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Trent Smith, who's a wonderful patron, only wonderful because he is a patron. I know nothing else about him. He could be a horrible person, but he does support me. He says, "No question. Just want to say thank you for the amazing content, Paul." Antonio Ambrose says, I love Deacon Harold. Can you explain, you, Deacon, how the Catholic, universal nature of our faith speaks to the unity of all races? We are both one and diverse. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, like, like, for example, in South Africa, right? Um, I mentioned that the, the, the priest used Latin in the Mass. And I was intrigued by that because I didn't expect to hear Latin. But he goes, that is a language that brings us all together. Right. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned how Jesus, there's no physical descriptions of Jesus in, in, in the scriptures as far as race, color. I mean, he's a Palestinian Jew. Right. So you can imagine what he looked like, but it, it didn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So what we have to do is look beyond our prejudices, look beyond our stereotypes, which we all have to see what God sees. Therefore, a man, uh, it says, um, therefore, the man is the man and his wife are both naked and not mm. ashamed. Because God was looking at them through his eyes, see, right? And so we need to see, like when I look at you, I see Matt Fred, I don't see white. I don't, I don't think white when mm. I see Matt Fred. I think, there's my, there's my good friend Matt Fred. I don't think white. That's where we need to get to. I don't want somebody to see me as a black Catholic. I'm a Catholic who's black. No, that doesn't mean I'm, I don't love my heritage. I'm not saying that. Mm-hmm. But when I die and say before Jesus Christ, he ain't going to ask me how black I am. Did you stand up for my son? Did you stand up for? T- I gave you the three talents of fatherhood, uh, of uh, uh, of sonship, and of the diaconate. Did you fulfill those those talents I gave you? Where's my tenfold, hundredfold, or did you bury him in the ground? I ain't gonna be that guy. See, this might be the crux of the dis- difference between critical race theory and the Christian view, right? Because the Christian view says person over group. You know, your yes. identity is your personal identity, where it seems to me when we talk about these Marxist it's things, it's about group, group identity. Pers- yes. And when you talk yeah. about group identity, you have to characterize and have a particular prejudice. That's the thing that holds the group together. The thing you're saying is, no, get away from the group and look at the person, get to know the person. See, they're saying, and when we attack, so when critical race theory is attacks these institutional and structures, to what end? What's, what's the end game here? Equality or... Parody, or uh, th- that's what I'm not clear. Even well, after reading all those books, I'm not clear as yeah, what is the yeah. actual goal. Because as us as Christians, it's heaven. <laughs> it's deep, intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, loving our loving our neighbor as ourselves. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. The two greatest commandments. That's that is the underpin for us. But I'm not sure what it mm. is for them. Stacy B says, I recently watched your talk on YouTube, becoming a man of prayer. How excited are you to see bishops leading the charge for being convicted men of faith in our current time? And, of course, Cordiglione, that's how you say his last name, isn't it? I always am afraid when I say his name that I've said it wrong, who has banned Nancy Pelosi from Holy Communion out of love. I think that's wonderful to see. What do you think? No, I, I agree. And I think it's time for our prelates to step from behind the curtain of sex abuse scandal. Okay. Uh, I think a lot of them have voices have been pulled back. They've been afraid mm-hmm. to speak out on, on difficult moral issues because of the credibility loss that happened with the sex abuse scandal. But now is the time, I think, for them to speak out boldly in love, 
the truth in love, just like, again, Bishop Strickland, Bishop Cordialoni, and, and others are not afraid to speak out on important moral issues that may be difficult to talk about that, that Catholics need to hear. Mm-hmm. You know, because sometimes I'm out there speaking on these things. I'm like, am I the only one? Where, where are the bishops at, you know? And, and I love the fact that they're uh, starting on Corpus Christi this year. They're going to emphasize a three-year, you know, um, uh, kind of uh, reinvigoration re, re- of the Eucharist. Oh, glory. You know, it's kind of this Eucharistic um, renaissance, if you will, which I'm really, really, really glad to see. And they put out a, a very good document on the Eucharist. It's basic. But that's what we need now. We need to get back to the basics of our faith. So they, they can't be afraid to speak out. Now, a lot of bishops didn't want to, you know, um, like did what Bishop Cardioloni did with with um, uh, with with yeah with Nancy Pelosi because they want to politicize the Eucharist. It's not politicizing the Eucharist. Excommunication is done out of love. That's what it's done out of. It's a it, it's a chance for the person to understand. Okay, I'm now separated from communion and a chance to think deeply and seriously about the positions they hold and come back to the faith. But what did she do? She just issued a statement doubling down mm-hmm. on what on what she believes. And that and we need to pray. We need to pray hard for her. But I think he did the right thing. I think more bishops should follow that lead. Again, these are we're not politicizing the Eucharist. These are issues of life and death that have become politicized. Yes. Now so, what happens when you allow a public notorious sinner like Nancy Pelosi to say awful things like we can kill the unborn and even celebrate the killing of the unborn, then if the bishops do nothing, then it it gives the impression that either abortion's not as bad as I'd thought or the Eucharist isn't what the church claims. It causes scandal and it's bad for her soul. So I've said it before, I'll say it again. Everybody out there should praise Bishop Cordelioni and any bishop that gets behind him right now because if we don't, we want our praise to be louder than the hatred coming from the opponents so that we can encourage them. Yes, No absolutely. matter what you think of the bishop, even if you've got criticisms, even if they're just criticisms, you know, no one likes... If you only talk to me when you're angry at me, it makes me very uninterested in what you have to say. But if you, if there's a balanced approach and you, I can tell you're in my corner, I'm a lot more open to, to listening. All right. Uh, Brian says, any advice for a young husband and father, he's 30 years old, feeling called to the permanent diaconate? Ah, Yes. So I was also young when I was ordained. The I started the program at 30. Hmm. Um, I was accepted into the program at 30. The formal training started a year later. And I, five years, I was 36 when I was ordained. I just turned 36. So uh, I was the youngest deacon ever ordained in the archdiocese and the, and the first one under, under, under 40. And I had young kids at the time. I had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and newborn twins. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah. So the first thing you want to do is talk to your wife absolutely because without the love and support of my wife it ain't going to happen because uh, a lot of dioceses are nervous right we have men that young considered the diaconate because they're thinking of the tension between uh the family life and kids that are small and the diaconate and the tension but what our archbishop at the, at the time did uh said was we think you guys can be a wonderful example of family life and so we're going to go ahead and ordain you, but, you know, I, we were the kind of guinea pigs, in other words. And as long as I listen to my wife as far as the, managing the time I'm spending away and, ba- and ba- find that balance mm. and really listen to her, not just listen to her, but listen to her heart, you know, as long as I did that, things worked out fine. Mm. Um, so that's what I say. Talk to your wife first. And if you both feel that this is something that you want to pursue, then go talk to your priest. Your parish priest will be the next stop. And then you can go talk to the uh the uh, di- our, uh um, office of the diaconate in your in your diocese and your new book or relatively new book on the diaconate yes our is, life of service see that's yeah. important is that that language of service because i'm sure there's a fear on the part of the bishop of the diocese that somebody enters the the, the middle of their life and, and they're, they're looking for maybe prominence of some kind or to be respected in their in their community but first and foremost this is a matter of you become a servant yes absolutely yeah. so I, I talk about this tension in the book so maybe one thing you do is get the book and look at it. You can see what, what the diaconate service is about. I talk about marriage. I talk about the tension in the family. Mm. I talk about tensions in the parish. I talk, and so I don't shy away from that. Mm. But, I, but I, I bring those things up to see how we can all better serve the body of Christ together. Uh, the PJ says, I have heard from some teachers in states like California that they are not teaching critical race theory. How much of this is true? How many school districts include it as part of the curriculum in the United States? 
One teacher called me brainwashed for having even brought up the topic. He also told me to stop watching Fox News. As it turns out, <laughs> I don't watch Fox News. Yeah, I have no idea how many. And I know it's being proposed by school boards um, because I see snippets of things on YouTube and stuff like that. But I don't watch television and I'm not on social media. Oh, so I, I can't give an exact number of how many school districts in the United States have incorporated this or trying to incorporate it into their uh, curriculum for their students. What I find difficult, right, is that we. I would love to see more atheists become pro-life, you know, but, but what's tough is we get into these group mentalities where we feel like we can't have ideas or beliefs that aren't acceptable within our particular group, right? So I always have such respect when I meet an atheist or someone who's non-religious who's staunchly against abortion because it shows me that they're thinking for themselves, right? Pro-life isn't a conservative word. It's just about the truth. My fear is, okay, so on the left, it's like they have a monopoly on being against racism. My fear is then that you have people on the right who are afraid to dress racism because they feel like it's become a left word. Does that make sense? And yeah. so how do we as parents educate our children about the evil of racism? I mean, it's, a, it's an obvious question in one sense, but. Yeah, I, I think it's really teaching them about what it means to be made in image, image and likeness of God and to see everyone and to expose them. And, and so, for example, here's one of the things I have in the book, Matt. And our, remember, I talked about our little parish. We had St. Bonaventure and St. Yeah. Uh, 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 St. Patrick there. Mm -hmm. Well, the parish now, Matt, is half Vietnamese, the other half are Africans, Filipinos, and a bunch of other very, very diverse church. So we started putting images in the church that looked like the people worship in the church. So we nice. have a statue of our leader, Levang. Mm -hmm. We have uh, St. Martin de Porres. We have an icon screen with St. Kateri Tetequitha mm -hmm. and other saints of color on there. So when you walk in, imagine walking to a, a, a white parish, let's say, and um, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. But you walk in, and as you walk into the church, there's a beautiful picture of Josephine Bikita. Mm. And your child says, Mommy, who's that? Or Daddy, who's that? Well, that's Josephine Bikita. Who is she a saint? Oh, yeah, she's a saint. She used to be a slave, and they really treated her bad. But then she became a nun, and she actually thanked the people that enslaved her because if it wasn't for them, she would not have known Christ. And and, and now this child's looking at a black person a different way, aren't they? Mm. You see what I'm saying? Well, so this, we have to, we have to counter to yeah. the stereotypes that they're exposed to mm -hmm. with positive mm -hmm. images. Mm -hmm. Even though your, your church is living at Seton, you don't have anything to do with it. Just when became the so what? Put some, uh, St. Juan Diego, some saints of color up there and you so that a, people can see the rich, beautiful mm -hmm. diversity Amen. of the church. Amen. What book did you write about a black saint? Uh, it was called uh, Father Augustus Tolton, the slave who became the first African-American priest. I want to say black priest, but yeah, you know, yeah, the, the, yeah. the publisher black. wanted yeah, to say yeah. African-American. <laughs> African -American, okay. you know, um, uh, so, and my book is not about his life. Okay. My book is about lessons we can learn from his life. Yeah. So I, I would have, I would have not, I would have changed the title if it were me. But, but I like that. That's one way that Catholics can talk about race is by this this lady. She's the patron saint of, uh, is it sex slaves or? Because um, I think yeah, she was, yeah, human trafficking. What's her name again? Saint Josephine Bakita. So Saint Josephine Bakita. So people should look her up, and you could use that as a beautiful story to talk to mm -hmm. your kids. Yeah. Uh, Colin Carr says, what are Deacon's thoughts on reparations? Seems to me that all other forms of forgiveness require some sort of penance or payment by the wrongdoer to work towards reconciliation. Is it really just to settle on the fact that most of those responsible for the victimized by past racial crimes in the U.S. aren't around anymore? So what's your take on reparations? Well, that's the thing. I, I don't I don't mention reparations in the book. That's a secular way of dealing with the issue. Mm. I'm dealing with it from a faith based perspective. You know, um, and so, um, you, know, uh, you know, we say that Jesus paid the price for our sins, but he didn't do it in money. He did it with the cost of his life. And so if we're going to make spiritual reparation, right, we have to, um, first of all, see this issue as important and, and put the work in and the effort that it's going to take to be able to close that racial divide. So, for example, another example I have in the book is you have, there's some amazing documents that are put out by U.S. bishops on issues of race over the years or black bishops or a committee yeah. on racism. Wonderful documents. Start a parish group twice a month to study those documents together. And if you don't have any black people or people of color in the parish, bring in people from other parishes. 
that are and have a little meal together, have a little potluck, have a little, and then and then sh- and, and break bread and share, you know, a few paragraphs, you know, maybe half hour, forty five minutes, maybe an hour, twice a month, mm. to really get a, bring an understanding of and, and have people share their experiences and share their stories and share their frustrations. Because now you go, I didn't realize that was an issue. Oh, I didn't realize. So now we're learning, we're growing together as a people of faith. We're we're meeting each other where we are. And we're helping each other to, to move further. And as we can more we do that, the more we begin to close that racial divide. I think I think that's more effective than than paying money. Again, that's a secular again, that's somebody else secular can culture that. has ways of answering that, but I'm right. approaching from from a faith. Do you still run your podcast? Do you yeah, still yeah, run so I um I haven't done it in a while because I've been yeah. what, what's been happening, Matt, is that um when all those things were canceled in twenty twenty, early twenty one, yeah, um, they didn't want to make them up. Last year, they don't want to wait till next year. So I've been mm. really, I mean, hitting the ground running for the past, even before Lent, like every single week I'm on the road. So I haven't been able to do the podcast, but I want to get back to it again. I what, could just see that yeah. being a beautiful thing for you to do is to read through a document and help people understand what's going on so we could learn from Yeah, you. that's a great idea. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm going to do that, Matt. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. Just make sure you pay me. I'm just joking. <laughs> um, so tell us about your website and where people can go and learn about you. Yeah, and just deaconharrell.com. Yeah, Very we, simple. Good. We have the link yeah. below so people mm-hmm. can check you out. That, that'd be yeah, really cool. Yeah, and I cool. do have some podcasts. I have uh, uh, several different podcasts I'm doing. I, I have a show I do with uh, my good friend Ken Hellenius, who's the mm-hmm. director of communications at the D. Nicholas Center for Ethics and Culture at Notre Dame. Um, you know, we oh God, we've done that. Well, it's a radio show, which now is being which now is uh, kind of being, broadcasting yeah, as a podcast. Being podcast as well. Yeah, we're so, gonna do a shout out to our friend Hector Molina. Who, oh, love Hector, man. <laughs> we're both big fans. Love that guy. Man. What's he doing? Is he got a podcast? Yeah, he's got a podcast called Walk in the Word. Check that out. Where Can he we does a link a to Sunday, that as well, Neil? Sunday reflections on, on the Walk Eucharist. In Walk the in the Word. Great. I love how passionate Great. that man is about yeah. Holy Scripture. He's just such a good man. He well, is. One of the honors of my job ministry is i get to meet people like you behind the scenes before the talk you know at the at the bar afterwards and i'm just continually impressed by the caliber of people and and hector is like that he's just a solid man loves his bride he's exactly who he is off stage as he is on yeah and he is world-class speak i mean when my mom died i had an engagement the weekend of her funeral and it was too late because my mom died like on Monday with the funeral was Saturday. Mm. It was too late to change to cancel or reschedule. So what are we gonna do? You're not gonna be here. What are we gonna do? I said, get Hector. We don't know who he is. Da, da, da. So they they called Peter Herbeck to vouch for Hector and Hector and they loved him so much they brought him back twice. Mm. They I mean Hector is the real deal. I love that guy. Mm. And and his family's beautiful family as well. And he also speaks Spanish. So yes. yes, it's something I keep thinking about is if if Catholics aren't doing a good job at helping our Spanish speaking brothers and sisters. Sisters, you know, then they might fall away from the Catholic Church and drift into different forms of Protestantism. Yeah. So we got to be and, doing you know, a And job. Hector's been pivoting, like so many speakers are, are doing, yeah. kind of moving away from speaking regularly. I mean, he's still taking engagements, but he's not taking nearly as many as he was before and, and kind of pivoting to more online uh, content, providing content that way. Let's do one more question. This comes from Philip98. He says, My girlfriend is a non-denominational Protestant who is holding some views that, unbeknownst to her, have ties to critical race theory slash Marxism. Often when I try to have conversations with her, we don't end up diving into the issues because out of a desire to avoid conflict, she says things like, it's okay to have different opinions and doesn't actually engage with the topic. How can we have better conversations? You you got to engage. I mean, here's the thing. Imagine if you did that in marriage, Matt. We're not going to talk about this because it's too hard. Oof. That's disa- That's a recipe for disaster right there. Absolutely. And you this know, guy's dating right now. So now's the dating, time to do now's it. Now's the time to do it because you want to see if this were to happen in our marriage, how we would respond to this right now. Mm. How we respond to this conflict and tension. You know, um, I, I, I had a guy recently whose, uh, I guess, daughter came out as gay or transgender, something like that, and the wife was supporting him. He wasn't. Mm. Ooh, how do you even begin to have a dialogue about that? You know, how do you begin to try to reconcile that in your marriage? So if you're not talking about these things now, oh, it's just have a different opinion. That ain't going to fly once once the rings go on. Yeah. You know, what, what, so you need to start talking about those things now. And it may cause some tension. You may you know, pull away for a while. But again, what's the point? Leading to the beauty of truth. And you might, you know? use, you might, this, epi- you might use this episode to share with her or some of the clips that we pull out of it to kind of help her begin dialoguing with you and understanding where you're coming from. But yeah, I would say that if you cannot have a conversation about serious things with your girlfriend, 
either learn how to or find a different girlfriend because as you say to not address these issues is only to have them blow up well, later and on sometimes there's a fear there within her like i'm I mean, she just she just believes it because she believes it she maybe hasn't really thought about why she believes it because maybe a lot of her friends believe it maybe she hasn't really done a lot of the work herself to really think through a lot of these issues and him pushing will force her to do that mm. you know so maybe she doesn't want to do it she just wants she's just very comfortable where she is right now but again look at christ crucified if you want to take things in your life to the next level you got to get uncomfortable mm. just like jesus on the cross you got to get uncomfortable to take everything in your life to that next level thank you for being here thanks for taking the time i know flying's a pain and i'm really grateful for you coming in studio i feel like this is just so much better than skype yeah, oh, absolutely. You know, Skype's absolutely. fine, but it's nice to be able to sit across the table. Yeah, and I'm so. honored to be here. It's great to be with yeah. you, man. It's the most time we ever spent together. Yeah. This is great. This is my yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like I just fly people in so I can chat with them. It's the greatest job in the world. So if people want to learn more about you, your website's the place to go. Yeah, deaconherald.com. Absolutely. Oh, all right. God bless. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Please subscribe and hit that bell button so my ego will get a boost. <laughs> Cheers.